Good morning and welcome to News File. This is your most authoritative news analysis platform. And here on News File, we put Ghana first. The Ministry of Health was the contracting party and had the responsibility to ensure that all the conditions for the LC were met before payments. The Ministry of Health was to ensure that pre-shipment inspection has taken place and all the conditions of the LC were met before payment. Not doing so, to my mind, was inexcusable and reckless because it is the Ministry of Health which approved all the payments apart from those ordered by the court after A3 sued Big C General Trading LLC. In my view, therefore, if anyone was culpable, it ought to be those in charge of the Ministry of Health and not the Deputy Minister for Finance, who from the evidence officially performed his duty. That is from pages 30 and 31 of the Court of Appeal decision, acquitting and discharging Castle Atoforsing and Richard Japa of the charges of causing financial loss willfully and misappropriation of public property in the controversial ambulance trial involving the payment of two point, almost four million euros by the state to those who were contracted to provide the ambulances that have been sitting <clears throat> here in Ghana and just rotting away like in some previous situations. Are they really free at last? Or the celebration will be short-lived? Join us here. We'll break it down. And we will also go to Parliament where the Affirmative Action Bill, Gender Equity Bill, has now become law after over two decades of pursuits. What will it change in reality? I'm Samson Ladia Yenini. We'll be right back to deal with the Vex Matters. Welcome back. And here is Samson's take. I title it Drip. Yes. Just a drip of judgment. Just a drip of good judgment. Just a drip of common sense. A steady, continuous flow of small water droplets. That's what we talk about when we say drip. It's like a leak where some small little water drops. Government has just commissioned what it calls the drip. And the drip represents the district road improvement project. That's a lot of common sense and good judgment for the benefit of the people. Those for whose welfare the powers of government are exercised. The drip, as you see on your screen, has equipment, motor graders, backhoes, rollers, wheel loaders, 
bulldozers, mark that, bulldozers, tipper tracks, concrete mixers, water tankers, and low beds. All of these are to ensure that at the local level, at the unit level, the bad roads are taken care of. 2,240 units of the road construction equipment have been bought. Bought with your money and for good purpose and ought to be applauded. That's what governance must mean. But did we actually need all of that? Not too long ago. Bulldozers were arrested and set ablaze on site. They are very expensive. They cost run into hundred and sometimes over that much in United States dollars. The state arrested some of them, a good number of them, and set them on fire against the clear details of law about what should be done when these are arrested because they are involved in Galamse. There is every good sense in the law that when they are arrested and it is found properly that they were put to that wrong use or illegal use, they shall be distributed by the state, not bent. Distributed by the state to the state's own agencies that have need for excavators, for bulldozers. And the state, from the president, even to the attorney general, defended the illegal, reckless, and lack of common sense conduct. State money was used for the processes so much and do arrested and destroyed, bent. When the law doesn't say burn them. And at the time as I spoke, a number of district chief executives had spoken to me about how they had a need for just one each of these important you know, machines and they didn't have. They just needed one they didn't have. And that it will make such a difference in their communities. Well, in this my job, I get to do it the way I ought to do, and I lose friends and gain some. But it has to be said when it has to be said. Just a drip of good judgment, common sense, will save this country a lot of waste. And that is my take. The table attached to exhibit BF3, where a military officer does not pay his debts, which of the reasons for release is applicable to him? My lady is misconduct and is having failed to settle his private debts. Please tell the court whether misconduct appears in exhibit BF3, which is the army's release letter to exhibit two. My lady, no. Now that you do not know, or you cannot tell the court, sorry, you cannot tell the court who released the confidential records of the A third accused person <coughs> to the minister, were you able to find out from your um, were you able to institute an inquiry into, into it? My lady, I did not receive any correspondence, but uh, some documents have been released in the court, so I couldn't 
do that. Very well. The BF1 is addressed to the Honorable Minister for Justice and Attorney General. Yes, is that right? Have you seen any court order served on you or made available to you that indicates that as a BF1 to be released to the Honorable, to the Office of the Honorable Attorney General? No, my lady. When, when you compare as a BF1 uh, to as a bit be a firm uh, the rule of law, I'm an adherence to, to the rule of law, and clearly our appeal against a decision. This is the first time that a decision adverse to the prosecution has been um, given by a court. Remember when there was an order after we had led so much evidence against um, Dr. Openi, the High Court actually ordered that we should commence de novo. What did I do? I filed an appeal to the Court of Appeal, and I was able to sustain the appeal. And, and so I, I think that that is what will be done promptly in this matter. We'll file an appeal to the Supreme Court for the Supreme Court to give a definitive um, 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 view on, on the matter. And I think that clearly in this decision by the, by the Court of Appeal is wrong, is unfair to the nation, and must not be allowed to stand. If indeed it stands, it, it will set a very dangerous precedent for the nation. It goes against the gain of all the authorities on causing financial laws in the country. And in my respectful view, there is no case in which financial laws has been more clearly established than this one. The financial laws established, and also as a result of the acts of the accused person here, it's so clear. You find an accused person who <laughs> even profited several thousand euros out of the 2.3 million euros that was, that was paid for the ambulances. I have never in my life seen an attorney general who is emotionally attached who has thrown professionalism to the dogs? I have never in my look in my young age. How has he I thrown thought, professionalism to the dogs? Please, I'm coming. I'm coming. You in have to answer young, that, please. Yes, I'm, I'm. I'm dealing with that. In my young age, I've seen Obeda Samoa. I saw Nanado. I saw Papa Uzwankoma. I saw my own company law lecturer, Jogati. I saw Marietta. I saw Martin Amido. I have never seen this level of emotionally unintelligent associated with the conduct of a criminal case like this. But you see, I am not surprised at all. I am not surprised. And I've been listening to him while he was talking. Look, if Godfrey has any scintilla of shame left in him, now to insinuate that the decision undermine the fight against corruption. You, the one that were coaching an accused person to undermine the court process. You heard what the trial judge said in her ruling on the mistrial. And instead of this attorney general apologizing to the good people of Ghana, he's out there ranting. Whatever he wants to do, let him go ahead and do it. We are ready. Look, what Godfrey Dami doesn't know, that Kinsella to force him, he's not a coward. He's not a coward. He is not. He is willing to stand up to anything. Nobody is afraid of Godfrey Dami's treachery. Nobody is afraid of his treachery. <laughs> Right. So parliamentarians, the minority side, minority group, because this parliament does not exactly have a minority. <laughs> um, celebrating the judgment of the Court of Appeal, acquitting and discharging Hazel Atoforsing and Richard Japa of the charges of causing financial loss to the state willfully and misappropriation or application of uh, state resources, so to speak. Before them, for the benefit of our radio audience, you had Godwin 
Eduji Tameklo, a young lawyer with impressive record so far at the practice. Then you heard before him the Attorney General, youngest ever in the history of the country, with a considerable record in the Republic. And before the Attorney General, you had two lawyers, Dr. Abdul Basit Bamba and Tadio Sori. If you ever get under cross-examination under them and you survive it, you should thank God. Those two guys will literally kill you under it. My guests are in the studio. Sami Jemfi is National Communications Officer of the NDC. He's a lawyer. Joseph Dindiok Penka is former Deputy Attorney General and Minister for Justice and also former MP Tempani. Bobby Banson is lawyer and lecturer, Ghana School of Law. He's the author of two legal texts within a very short space of time in civil procedure and commercial arbitration. Joining us on uh, Zoom will be Sevia Kuji, the public relations officer of the Ghana Bar Association that have been criticizing the Attorney General. And some people say, okay, now we can see that the GBA is being fair. Because if the special prosecutor was issuing similar statements or statement that didn't even contain as much and they hounded the special prosecutor, how about the attorney general? And they have means no words about it, that the attorney general's statement is wrong. We'll have them justify it this morning. Gentlemen, good morning and welcome to the show. Good morning. Good morning. What a panel, the week that the affirmative action law was passed. <laughs> That's a shame. Anyway, the next panel, women with sufficient gravitas will join us to ask what difference the affirmative action and gender equity bill pass into law will <coughs> do. Let me commence this discussion by doing this. Professor Stephen Kweku Asari, he's also known as Kweku Aza. This is his summary of the 125-page judgment of the Court of Appeal. And it's a very brief summary, so let me read it to you. He says, the ambulance judgment without tears, making it simple for you to appreciate. One, the court concludes that no reasonable court focused on justice would have found that the defendant, that's Jaqua and Kesila Tofosing, had a case to answer. Two, the contract in question is between the Ministry of Health and Big C, the Dubai-based company. Three, the Ministry of Finance merely facilitates the contract by authorizing the letter of credit and does not become a party to the contract by doing so. Four, nor does the Ministry of Finance assume any responsibility for the quality of the goods delivered or even ordered. Five, if the delivered goods are non-conforming, it is the responsibility of the Ministry of Health to exercise its contractual remedies. Six, failure to do so, potentially causing financial loss to the state, places the criminal burden solely on the Ministry of Health and not the Ministry of Finance. That's the ministry Atto Forcing was deputy for for authorizing the letters of credit. Seven, the Ministry of Health has a contractual duty to mitigate damages. This is important when the contract morphs into the criminal arena and issues arise about financial loss. Eight, if a deputy minister signs a letter of credit on behalf of the minister and the minister does not contest the delegation of authority, it is unreasonable to assert that the deputy minister had no authority, as the prosecution was asserting in this case. 
9. If the prosecution claims the deputy minister lacked authority, this negative framing cannot shift the burden onto the deputy to prove his authority. The theory that it does is perverse. It is always the burden of the prosecution to prove what it alleges. As we go through the judgment, you find that he's stating exactly what the court had to say. The agent of Blue Sea, uh, Big C, that is Japa. Japa is agent. Big C is what we call in law the principal. The agent of Big C cannot bind the state. He was compensated by his principal following a court order. 11 and finally, it is perplexing that the agent faces charges of willfully causing loss to the state, especially when the basis of his being asked to open his defense differs from the original charges. Let me begin with Sevia. What do you have to say about this judgment? As far as you know Nothing. about the case. Hello, Savia. Okay, I'll get back to Savia because his line is a bit frozen. Bobby, I know without a doubt you have read all of it. Um, just like me, I've tried. <laughs> <laughs> yes, okay, Savia is back. Hello, Savia, what's your comment about this judgment? Yeah, I was saying that maybe I had a call in, that's why. Uh, I was saying that. Uh, I have nothing much to say except to say that the court has decided and we must accept it, except otherwise decided by a superior court other than the uh, Court of Appeal. The principles, of, the principles of law enunciated by the majority in this case, the two justices, yes. do you associate with them that they have enunciated them properly? Well, sometimes I might say that uh, I have not had the benefit of reading the judgment. Mm. So I would be careful uh, in passing comments. But okay. if the majority, majority are of the view that that is what it is, that is a decision of the court. The good thing is that avenues are there for us to make our complaints known mm. at the higher level All right. of the court. Yeah. Thank you. Since you have not actually read, let me come to Bobby. In reading this decision, mm. just too many, over a dozen criminal law principles, mm. even including commercial law, if you like, appear, you know, internal regularity and all of that, appear in the, in the way they discuss it. Do you have cause to fault any of them in the way they enunciate the law? Oh, good morning once again um, to Sami and Senior. Um, I, I have had the opportunity to read the judgment, I would say almost twice. Um, the beauty about it is that you will notice that both the dissenting opinion and the majority all agreed on the issues for determination. Two, they almost all agreed to the facts. Three, they almost all use the same authorities, case law and statute. Four, the evidence that was led was what all of them relied on. Five, is that their conclusions were different. That is the beauty of the law. And each judge supported his reasoning with the authorities. Now, if you look at um, the, the lead decision by the majority, you would see that, like you rightly said, he didn't limit his analysis to only criminal law, quack criminal law. That's For right. example, he analyzed the grounds of appeal. And that is where a lot of the discussions have lost sight of. Mm. It is not all the grounds of appeal that the appellants filed that were upheld. About five or so. He struck them out. Relying what, on the... Yeah. Sami, were you mm -hmm. sitting in the court? Uh, when they... Well, when they were delivering the judgment? No, no. Okay. But, but I'm told that the judgment was not read. Okay. They just read the introductory uh, and the points, effects. 
and the conclusion. Okay. So this is the kind of judgment that when you are sitting in the court, even as a lawyer, mm -hmm. you are not too sure what's going to happen to your client. Until you get to page 30, then you begin to see your way clear mm -hmm. as to where mm -hmm. the judge who is reading mm -hmm. is going. But even <coughs> that, that is only one judge. Mm -hmm. So you are not even sure what, what the next will do. do. So if you are not careful, <laughs> you'll be in trouble. Okay, yeah. go on. So, so yeah. I think they did an extensive job. Um, mm -hmm. Like I was saying, he used the rules of the grounds of appeal. Right. That I thought yeah. is limited to only appeals in civil matters to set aside or strike out the grounds of appeal, even though it was a criminal matter. That is an interesting approach by the judge because if you take the Court of Appeal rules, there's the part one that deals with civil appeals and the part two that deals with the criminal appeals. Mm. And you do not see the rule eight, as he discussed in the civil appeals, being repeated in the criminal appeals. So, but unfortunately for us, we will not have the benefit of having this approach by him in respect of the grounds of appeal tested because the um, appellants won at the end of the day. And so it doesn't matter how they won, once their most important grounds of appeal, being that the decision by the trial judge in March 2023, was unreasonable compared to the evidence that had been supported. And everything else falls under it. And so I, I, I would say that irrespective of how you look but at isn't it. Isn't that how the judge intelligently handled it? After striking out all the yes. others, he came on that omnibus one. And, and was then I do that with the issue. There, were two. Yes. there were two. Yeah, there were two. Not just the omnibus. Yeah. The mm. omnibus, which is actually the central ground, mm. the central mm. ground. for any appeal, mm. that the, the, mm. the evidence mm. is against mm. the weight of mm. the judgment. Mm. And those he dismisses. He dismisses them on the grounds that, by law, when you say a judge has erred in law, you must particularize the error. the error. If you say they have erred in fact, you must particularize the facts. But here they were, they just said erred in law, erred in law, they didn't state the particulars. The particulars. And you say you disagree with that? No, that, no, that should only I'm apply in that, civil and not criminal. No, that is, I'm saying that all the analysis and the authorities he used mm -hmm. were in respect of the rules on civil appeals. Okay. Honorable is here. If you take the criminal appeals, you do not find those rules there. And so taking it, because we know that in a judge exercising criminal ju jurisdiction mm -hmm. will not necessarily have the right to make determination when it comes to civil. So it was an interesting thing. I'm not saying he's wrong, okay. but that was the first time that I have seen that in purely criminal matter, the rules that apply to civil appeals were being used strictly to strike down grounds of appeal. So imagine that even though they say appeal is by way of rehearing, imagine that the appellants did not have as one of the grounds of appeal that the judgment was against, is unreasonable com as, as um, uh, related to the mm. evidence that had been led. It, it means, means that the appeal, the may have, appeal would have gone. Exactly. And so you see that he took his time mm. to actually go through everything step by, by step. Okay. And the way he narrated the facts from the beginning of the judgment, made it very easy for you to situate his analysis in that context. Okay, so because you have begun from there, let me restate here. There were six grounds of appeal. The judge, the majority, be began the decision by dismissing four of the grounds and upholding two of the grounds. The grounds that were left on the basis of which this whole judgment hangs are these. The court violated the right to fair trial of Atuforsin when it disregarded evidence in favor of Atuforsin. And then finally, the court erred in shifting the burden of proof on Atuforsin to prove that he had the authorization of the Minister, mm -hmm. Minister of Finance to request the Bank of Ghana to set up the letters of credit for payment of the ambulances. Right, now get to the meat. Whether I, I agree with the decision. Yes. Apart from the, where I said I wasn't sure whether you could apply the rules of civil procedure to strike a grounds of appeal in a criminal appeal, I think essentially I do not find a reason to, to, to dissent from the decision by the majority. Mm. Because the way he set out the charges, you know, you see that the element that he was expecting the evidence to be adduced of were not met at all. If, 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 if you read it, the count one, the, I don't know if we would have the opportunity to read it, you would see that the way the Attorney General set it out, you would expect that the facts or the evidence that will be led 
will meet these ones. You mentioned one of them, and that was at the tail end of the charge, mm. the particulars of offense. Mm. You see that it says that, count one, that the, will, so the, the statement of offense was willfully causing financial loss. Now, the particulars of offense is what you are telling the accused person that you would adduce evidence in support. Now, if you read the particulars of offense, you, Castle Ato Forsen, between August 2014 and April 2016 in Accra, in the Republic of Ghana, willfully, now willfully means they must connote the menstrual, the intention there, caused financial loss of 2.37 million euros to the Republic by authorizing irrevocable letters of credit. Now come to the end, without due cause and authorization. And so one, you must be able to prove as a prosecution at the end of your case that Mr. Tufosin had the intention. The intention to what? That at the time he was authorizing the payment, the vehicles were not fit for purpose. That is the first proof mm. that at the time he was authorizing the LC, sorry, the LC, the vehicles were not fit for purpose. Two, you must be able to prove that he did not have the authority to authorize the LC. And so if you come to court and then your evidence shows that, one, he was only playing the role, and that is essentially where the court started from, in his official capacity as the minister for, deputy minister for finance, and that he did not, was not responsible for the contract. He did not play any role in the contract, not before, not after. Two, that the LC was not payment. And you see the judge dwelling on that, that LC, and when the former Minister for Health was cross-examined, even though initially he said no, Could eventually, no. yes, mm -hmm. he said yes, LC is no payment, that the wording of the LC was very clear, that if these conditions are met, now whose responsibility is it to make sure that the conditions are met? That is why the judge said that responsibility lies with the Minister for Health. Right, that Atu forcing wrote requesting urgently that letters of credit mm. should be established mm. for the contract sum. And the witnesses that are called are almost called by the Attorney General mm. are almost all in agreement that the LC is not payment. Mm -hmm. It has conditions. Mm -hmm. And you're saying that as the court found the one to ensure that the conditions are met before payment is triggered is Ministry of Health or the and not the health. Finance Ministry. Yes, and not the Finance Ministry. Okay. And the second most important thing is whether or not he had the authority. Mm -hmm. And as the judges said, the majority, if you assert that he did not have the authority, you must provide something from the person who ought to have given him the authority right. so that the burden will shift on him. If you have not provided that fact that he did not have the authority. He had no burden to show or to demonstrate that he had the authority. That was why the judges said that the person who would have given that authority or not given that authority is Mr. Setepe. Right. And that the burden was on the state to provide evidence from Mr. Setepe, either in writing before, during, or even after, that I did not authorize you or I have not authorized you. Or that they you. ought to have called Setepe as a, as a, as a, and as a put him witness. under cross-examination. Mm -hmm. And that even when Setepe offers himself, they don't cross-examine him on the issue. Because he's the only material witness to determine whether or not he authorized Atto Forcing or he did not. Yes. So to the extent that the authorization <coughs> letter mm -hmm. says, I'm writing for and on behalf of Setepe, mm -hmm. and he does so, mm -hmm. the one responsible is not to force him, yes, but the minister, yes, and you didn't call the minister. You didn't call when the you minister. had the opportunity. You didn't also mm -hmm. cross examine him mm -hmm. on that issue, mm -hmm. therefore, you have failed. Mm -hmm. That is how come that issue was also failed because he relied the judge relied on, like you said, the presumption in the evidence act mm -hmm. that official duties are presumed to have been regularly done. And so, once official duties are presumed to have been regularly done, the burden shifts on the person claiming otherwise to establish a prima facie case mm -hmm. that it was not done. Now, if you, if you look at Mr. Jata, his was, I think, quite straightforward. That he was only an agent, not a principal. And basic law is that once the principal is disclosed, you do not fix liability on the agent. Two, 
Mrs. Japa was not a party to the whole contract. Three, the state never paid any money directly to Mr. Japa. Mr. Japa, sorry, I said Seti Japa. <laughs> Mr. Japa actually went to court. He sued his principal right. that have done work. We had agreed on 28% or so commission. You didn't pay me. And so I don't know whether he garnished the government, but it seems to be that because of that, that was the Attorney General's case, that he had pocketed money from a transaction that he thinks was, was, was vitiated for all the reasons that had been disclosed. Mm. So I think if you analyze the evidence the way the majority did and apply it to the facts and the law, I, I would find it difficult, except my... Um, um, okay. Not sure so about I'm, the I'm coming to aspect. I'm coming to the two politicians that, of course, who are also lawyers. Um, but before we do so, do you hear the judge, the majority saying that, dear states or attorney general, mm -hmm. you actually have the opportunity to recover your money if you really think that your two point almost four million. Uh, euros is lost because the people you should have pursued, you didn't pursue them. You ought to have pursued Big C. Mm. That's the principal. Mm -hmm. And you ought to be pursuing the Ministry mm. of Health mm. and not the Ministry of Finance. Mm -hmm. The Ministry of Health, there was a director. The chief director, I think. Who the state put a nolly prosecutor and got him off. So he wasn't prosecuted. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's still opportunity for the state to go after perhaps Big C or whoever it is in civil recovery? And I don't know why that has not been done. Because as the judge rightly said, as we speak now, the ambulances are there. Mm -hmm. And the, the evidence that used was that Big C had written a letter acknowledging the defects and saying that we will send technical men to remedy it. It was the, they said there was an expert opinion from Silver Star or so that, that right. said that the vehicle itself was not meant for that purpose. It means that Big C from the beginning has misrepresented the quality, the fitness, and once the, Mr. Sedbefia at that time, immediately the ambulances were um, collected, wrote to Big C, mm -hmm. he had satisfied all the conditions, except that I have not had the benefit, and I think the judge said it, of the agreement that was signed between Big C and the, and the Republic of Ghana or the Ministry of Health or whichever state agency signed it mm -hmm. to determine the ambit of, of the civil liability. Whether or not, since it was in 2014 or 16 thereabout, whether the issues of limitation would, would, would fall in play, which law would be applicable. And, and so that is what, if, if, if you don't have the benefit of all of those things, on the face of it, the state would have an opportunity to go subject against Big C, subject to the limitation and whatever the terms of that contract was. So, as disclosed by the judgment, by the contract, there was supposed to be an on-site inspection. So when the Big C wrote to Ghana and said, you are complaining about defects for the, was it 20 or 10 that had been brought in, mm -hmm. for defects, in the first consignment mm -hmm. that had been brought in. I'm looking and I will shortly uh, tell you that was 10 ambulances or there were about 20 that had been brought in. And they said, look, yes, we agree. You are saying there's certain medical component that should be in this uh, bench, but it is not. Mm -hmm. And they said, but it was your job to come to where it was to inspect, according to the contract. Mm. And you didn't come to inspect it. Mm. And at the time you were complaining, mm. they said another consignment was already mm -hmm. on its way and had been shipped 15 mm. days mm. <laughs> uh, after mm. the letter, the, uh, before the letter had re reached them. Mm. Then there was a third that also came, and all of them came to Ghana. Mm. Before uh, Alessek Befia, mm now decides to go to the place to inspect mm -hmm. at their place. Mm -hmm. And when they inspected, they agreed that we are bringing a number of our engineers to come to Ghana mm -hmm. to remedy mm -hmm. the effects. Mm -hmm. I don't think that would take away liability from Big C. The mm -hmm. reason being that they were also a contracting party. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have made representation as to the quality of product you were supplying. 
even though the buyer has an obligation to beware, it doesn't take away your obligation as a seller to represent the fact as it is. Right. And so the fact that the buyer did not come to inspect doesn't mean that you intentionally, on purpose, decide to supply products that were different from what had been represented, mm -hmm. or maybe the samples that were even shown. That's so right. I think that if subject to the issues of limitation and the specific terms of that contract, the state is minded to still pursue Big C, there's definitely an opportunity for them to do that. Okay, thank you. Now, Sami Jemfi. So the vehicles were brought in batches of 10. First 10, second 10, and third 10. A total of 30 vehicles at the cost of 2.370. What's your reading of this decision? <laughs> Thank you very much, Samson. <clears throat> a very good morning to our cherished viewers and uh, my senior uh, brothers in the studio. The judgment delivered by the Court of Appeal on this matter is a vindication of the truth. It is a vindication of the rule of law. You see, I am one of those who took time to follow this matter keenly. And I have studied various processes filed in this matter the various decisions that the court has given relative to this matter. And it's been very clear to me right from the get-go that this case was nothing but a political witch hunt. <laughs> it was nothing but a clear case of persecution against a leading member of the opposition who is deemed by the government as a stumbling block to their bad decisions in Parliament. They just cooked this case to intimidate him, to kick him out of Parliament, in the hope that there will be a by-election that they can influence with money, because according to them, fantasies are cheap. As um, um, the third accused disclosed in the course of the proceedings. That is what this whole case was about. It was total wickedness, but total nonsense, because there was nothing in it. And as I read the majority decision on this matter, something, I was, I was full of smiles. I was overjoyed to know that, look, we have men and women of conscience on the bench who are alive to their fidelity to the law, their fidelity to the state, and will not be misled by the whims and caprices of a despotic government who are only interested in harassing, intimidating, oppressing critical voices. That, for me, is what gives me joy. You see, it is important that, as lawyers, we help those watching who may be non-lawyers to appreciate what has happened. Because I'm saying, too many people, they think that Arthur Forsen, after making his case in court, has won a case. He has been declared winner in this matter. No, but far from that, that is not what has happened. For those who think that the court, after listening to Arthur Forsen and Jack Pye and all the other accused persons, has decided to adjudge them winners or has acquitted them and discharged them, that is not what has happened. What has happened is that the Court of Appeal, having looked at the entire evidence that was adduced before the High Court trying this matter. And by evidence, I'm talking about the facts canvassed by the prosecution and the testimony of all six witnesses of the state called by Godfrey Dami. The Court of Appeal is saying that on the basis of that evidence alone, 
they don't even have to hear the side of Atufosin. They don't even have to hear the side of Japa. They are saying that it doesn't make sense for the states to prosecute a case of willfully causing financial loss to the state against Atul Forsen and Japa. And the education has to be reinforced. <laughs> yes. That when you are accused of a criminal offense, mm -hmm. the law is that you are entitled to absolute and complete silence. You are not even supposed to say a word. You can be entitled to that. When you are put before the court, he that is accusing you has the burden to prove the accusation. So when they bring their people and they go through and at the end of their testimonies, you take the view or the court takes the view that they have not made a prima facie case against you, you should not be called to also be heard, your side be heard. That's what he's saying. Exactly. It's not as if the Court of Appeal said, as for this case here, don't call these people. Yeah. It's the, the process. The, in other words, the Court of Appeal is saying that they have not been able to adduce sufficient evidence to even warrant the accused persons to open their defense. That's right. The case is so frivolous, so bogus, so baseless and useless that the Court of Appeal is saying that the accused persons need not open their defense. I am not saying it. This is the Court of Appeal. Mm, and this say, is what we've been saying say all along. Are, to say they are saying it's so bogus, it's so frivolous. Uh... You see, I am even being charitable. <laughs> because Justice Akabuafo, my Lord Justice Akabuafo said, he doesn't find a logical, that is the word he used, a logical connection between the evidence and the finding that a prima facie case has been made against the accused person. Logical connection. I mean, how else can you explain this? How, I mean... It means that the case is so bogus. I don't recall the last time that the Attorney General took a criminal matter to court that the matter did not cross the threshold of submission of no case. I don't recall. I don't recall. This is what we've been saying all along. Do you mean like, like a, a case that is being prosecuted by, by Dami himself? Because it's a criminal matter. No, but criminal matter, there's a number of them that the Attorney General prosecutes. And we, we win submission of no case many times, so yes. it's not the no, case. No, in recent time. In recent yeah, very like, recent, yeah. Recent. Well, like which ones? Uh, we are in practice, so which we can one? say that. No, which ones? No, I, I'm saying I'm that. talking about a case like this where the Attorney General is so taking a matter so to qualify court. It, so qualify it. No, that like, a political prosecution, uh, exactly. a political uh, or public interest matter. Public interest well, matter like this. Right? Because obviously yeah. this was a, a matter of considerable public interest. That's right. Where the Attorney General himself has gone to court. He is the one prosecuting the matter. And the Court of Appeal says, look, this matter is so bogus that it cannot even cross the submission of no case threshold. The accused persons need not open their defense. It means that on the basis of your own evidence, your case is bogus. That is what they have told them. And that is my first point. Number two, Senior Bobby has already, you know, explained the ratio of the two-fold decision taken by the court. But I think it's important to still emphasize for those who don't get it. This matter is so simple. And don't allow Godfrey Dami to obfuscate the issues and confuse you. Godfrey Dami went to court, obviously under the instructions of his boss, the president, and his government, that... Ghana signed a contract to procure 200 ambulances. 30 of those ambulances have been supplied to us. Payment has been made to the tune of 2.37 million euros. Godfrey Dami says that the ambulances are defective. They are mere vans. And so it means that Ghana has lost... Experts have certified that. That is what That there says. are defects. Yeah, that's what he mm. says. And so it means that Ghana has lost 2.3 million euros. And the person who caused that financial loss, number one, is Atu Forsen. What did Atu Forsen do? Two things. He wrote two letters, one dated 7th August 2014, the other dated you know, 2012, the other dated 7th, uh, no, 2014, 7th August 2014 and 12th August 2014. And these were letters directing the central bank or requesting the Be central careful, bank. Because directing to exactly. <laughs> instructing was, rather. Was agreed yes. that was request. Requesting the central bank to establish a letter of credit. Okay. Okay. For those ambulances. 
and the second one was a letter to the controller for certain monies to be released for the purposes of establishing that LC. So because of that, Atu Forsen has caused you woefully for and on behalf yes. of Setepe. No, Godfrey Ami says he didn't have any authorization. <laughs> you understand? Atu Forsen without cause, due cause or authorization, just wrote letters requesting for the LCs to be established. Then the Court of Appeal is saying, look, all you are accusing this man of doing, that he wrote a letter to the central bank for the purpose of requesting them to establish an LC. How did that letter Atto Forcing wrote occasion a financial loss? Because the letter was to request for letters of credit to be established in favor of DC. An LC is not payment. It is a guarantee of a promise of payment. On Your own witnesses, three of them, Mr. Makwe, Ajimamenu, and the other one, all of them in the box admitted that a letter of credit, which is at all since crime, according to Godfrey Dame, is not payment, but a promise or a, or, or a guarantee of a promise of payment based on conditions. So the cost is, what were those conditions? And who had the responsibility to check and ascertain whether those conditions have been met? Was it Atto Fawcett? No. Did Atto okay. Fawcett take any other step beyond requesting them to establish the LC? No. Did Atto Fawcett do anything wrong in even writing the letter? No, he was only performing his official duty. So how do you connect any loss that is assuming without admitting that there's been a loss to Atto Fawcett? when he, has not, he was not the one who made payment or approved the payment. He only asks for an instrument, an, a letter of credit to be established, which is only a guarantee of a promise of payment based on conditions. So they throw you <coughs> out, number one. Number two, they say that you claim that the man in writing that letter didn't have authorization. Who has the responsibility to prove that he didn't have authorization? Godfrey Dame and the trial judge. Justice Efia Sewa, say that, Samson, if I say you are a thief, and you say you are not a thief, then the onus is on you to prove that you are not a thief. Godfrey Dami goes to court and says, Arthur Fawcett didn't have authorization writing those letters. Arthur Fawcett says, I had authorization. In fact, he had not even opened his defense. But these are things that his lawyers put across during cross-examination of prosecution witnesses. Mm. The judge says, because the state says you didn't have authorization and you claim you had authorization, then come and prove you had authorization. Remember, the judge ah. also references the statement, mm -hmm. caution statement or statement that Setepe had given. Mm -hmm. Even though the Supreme Court, the Court of Appeals says at the time uh, Setepe was giving that statement, mm -hmm. confirming that ABC had yeah. done. He said he needed better information because yes. he needed recollection yes. and things. So the judge didn't just base it on. She just based it on that. No. 100%. She added that. 100%. No. no you can't no, challenge. No. Because it was rather Atto Fawcett and his lawyers who were impressing on the judge to consider that caution statement of Setepe. Which caution statement? That is the ground, the, that, the, the, the third, the sixth ground of appeal that the judge did not take into account a material evidence that could have inured to the benefit of Atto Forsen. Because to Dr. Bassett, that caution statement by Sir Tepe was conclusive, that he was aware of what his deputy Atto Forsen did. And the judge said, no, that evidence has not been cross-examined. Mm. That there you has understand? been an inference made. <laughs> exactly. But it does not meet that inference does not meet the test. Exactly. But, for but, establishing but if you a read, but if you read okay. the, 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 that ruling of the judge, she lays out the law in her view, which is that when a party assets the positive mm. and another assets the negative, the onus is on the one asserting the negative to, to adduce evidence. And uh, my, my, my lord. Uh, Akabuafo and uh, Bright Mensa were very clear that that position is alien to the law. He who alleges must prove, especially in criminal matters, the accused person has no duty, no responsibility to participate 
or to aid in his own prosecution. So if you claim he had, he had no authorization, prove it. There was no evidence on record, Samson. Mm. No evidence. Not even one of the witnesses who were called by the Attorney General testified to the effect that Atto Fossey had no authorization. No evidence. And yet the judge says, Atto, come and show that you had authorization. The Court of Appeals says this was travesty of justice. It should not have happened in the first place. Atto Fossey had no business <laughs> even opening his case, mm. what has happened was a so, complete waste of time. Thank you. And that is why they have dismissed the matter. But you see, Samson, you asked Bobby a question, which I totally disagree with, because that is not the view I got reading the judgment. The judges in the majority are not saying that the state can have a case or can have a remedy if they decide to go after the Ministry of Finance or the, min, the, 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 the oh, officers and the Ministry of Health. Are making from no, the no, no. It's an obvious inference. No. Read paragraph very, very 150. Obvious. Read paragraph 150. What, 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 Let me tell which you. Part? <laughs> because when you which come down to paragraph 150, mm -hmm. the, 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 my, my Lord Akabuafo even begins to look at the issue of whether or not there's been a loss. Because you, you hear him saying, that here is, a, here is the case that the ambulance in question have been supplied you. The ambulance you paid for have been supplied you. You say that there are defects with the ambulances. You have traveled to go and meet the supplier. In line with the provisions of the contract, you have negotiated an amicable settlement, which is that the supplier should ship to you the parts that are missing from the ambulances for the defects to be remedied. Meaning that the parties have agreed that the defects can be remedied. And that agreement has been signed. And the party in fulfillment of its obligations under that new agreement, if I can call it that, that, that mm. have shipped the, the parts to you, which got to Ghana as far back as November 2016. Then he references what Ajima Menu, Minister of Health, said in the witness box. You had a duty to clear the parts and notify Big C so that they will come and install the parts in the ambulances and train your officers on the operation of the ambulances. Ajima Menu told the court that they didn't have any money to clear the medical supplies from the ports. So that is why if you read paragraph 150, Okay, so let me just read that. Let's read paragraph 150. Uh, yes. Paragraph 150 says that, um, it, in, my respect to, in my respectful opinion, it defies logic mm -hmm. that Jakpa at business, mm -hmm. agent of the supplier, mm -hmm. Big C, would be charged with causing financial loss to the state based on the facts in the record of appeal when the plan put in place to rectify the defects of the ambulances to enable their use has not been implemented because the government failed to meet its obligations under the roadmap agreed to in 2016. Mm -hmm. In any event, that roadmap leading to the shipment of the parts to Tema Port mm -hmm. was agreed upon between the Ministry of Health mm -hmm. and Big C, mm -hmm. not with Japa at business. Mm -hmm. So it is not clear why Japan at business will be asked to go and pay mm -hmm. and clear the items to rectify the anomalies on the ambulances. Mm -hmm. As a corollary to the foregoing, mm -hmm. it bears mentioning that if there are vehicles, if there are vehicles, even if deficient in even certain deficient. requisite parts mm -hmm. packed in Ghana, mm -hmm. an action plan in place mm -hmm. between the Ministry of Health and the supplier Big C to rectify the deficiencies. And the additional parts or accessories in storage at Temaport for the said rectification, then there is a need to reassess the quantum of the alleged loss, mm -hmm. a factor that impacts the case against all the, the accused, accused in, in this case, yes. and calling into question the maturation of the charges profit the against the accused person. Of the charges. So, so, so you get my point here. Yeah, so let's be clear. Okay. It is you see, not the I, case. I was the one who. It is not the okay. case so the that. They, you cannot from this judgment mm -hmm. discern mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. there are 
proper people who should be charged if there should be a charge. That there are proper people you can take on in a civil matter for a recovery if you desire to do so. Mm -hmm. It's the quantum. Yeah, exactly. not, not, not the quantum. Aside the issue, to you. no, he just spoke about the need to reassess the quantum. Yeah. And then he says it calls into question the maturation of the charges. What is he talking about? Because he is trying to tell you mm -hmm. that if you say that somebody has supplied ambulances to you, but the ambulances are deficient, right. and you have agreed with the person on the rectification, of those deficiencies. Mm -hmm. And the person has supplied, and the person has supplied you with the things, and you have taken delivery of the things, but you have refused to clear those things, then the question of whether or not you can even charge the person of financial laws mm -hmm. is something that we must talk about Thank in the you. first place. Yes. Because for no, me, no, it's okay. It's because, oh, let me just conclude. Point is made. Because okay. for me, Thank you. Point is made. no loss, mm -hmm. no loss was occasioned under this transaction Thank you, until Sammy. The yeah. Kufuado Baumia and the government you, under yeah. Ajima Menu, oh, I just want to land. No, no, Let no, me no. just land. It's enough. In 30 seconds, it... decided, decided for cheap politics to, you know, leave those medical supplies at the port without clearing them so that they could make a case of woefully uh, uh, causing financial okay. loss so, against that of So here we are again. So they are the ones who have caused the loss. So, Sami, thank you. Here we are, we are again, Ghana, in a situation like the Gallopers, right? The <laughs> famous Gallopers. Um, Okay, you suggested one thing. Yeah. I, I need just a minute's reaction, please, and okay. I'll stop you. All right. You suggested one thing that this is a political witch hunt against Atto Forcing because he's a leader yeah. of the minority in parliament. Yeah. This case was filed on the 23rd of December 2021. Yeah. Atto Forcing was not the minority leader. Yeah. Can I answer you? Number one, if you go and watch what I said, I didn't say because he was the leader. I said one of our lead parliamentarians who was deemed as a stumbling block to government's bad decisions. Even though he was not minority leader, he was a ranking member for finance. And if you recall the time they filed this matter, it was in the heat of the debate over E-Levy when the finance committee, our, our, our side of the finance committee, took a stand against the E-Levy and the 2022 budget. And so he was already in leadership as a ranking member for finance, very vociferous and very and at the forefront of our struggle against the Franka, and his governance. Let's take government. it from there before I bring you to some portions of the substance of the judgment. Uh, our sincere apologies to our radio audience. We had a little hitch. Please forgive us. From the suggestion of the NDC, the theory of a witch hunt, which is bolstered by this decision that you were backing at the wrong tree in the first place, that he only signed an LC, which no, is not a, payment. A letter requesting for an a, LC. A letter requesting for an LC, thank you very much. Which goes through a process to the Bank of Ghana, right? And he does so for and on behalf of the minister, the LC does not, the letter requesting the LC does not mature into an LC. The letter requesting the LC does not become money unless various conditions have been fulfilled. These conditions were conditions that it was the Ministry of Health that had a duty to ensure that they have been fulfilled before the guarantee will become money. So how on earth do you leave everybody at the Ministry of Health and you go attack the person who signed the request for LC subject to a condition, conditions, which conditions were not his job? And again, he is doing this on the back of a decision of the Attorney General that says, the guy, we owe these people money. So go ahead and make sure we are paying them. They say that Atu Fosing was invited to Ioko sometime in 2017. Correct? Mm -hmm. Sami Jemfi, I need your attention. That Atu Fosing was invited to Ioko sometime in 2017, in November or when? Um, well, and I that, don't have that date of it. And that between the time he was invited to Ioko for interrogation, from that time, Ioko seems to have given them the impression that there was nothing against Atu Fosing. So from 2017 until 2021, 
after the e-levy issue that you go after him. That's the theory of the witch hunt. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, thanks, Samson. Thanks, uh, my brothers, for all the submissions. I'm, I'm a little bit under the weather, so mm. let's just understand me. I have read the judgment from the beginning all the way to the end. And I have listened to my colleagues, I've listened to you. But it's one thing that I just thought that I, I put in perspective. Mm. It appears that none of them said anything at all about the dissenting opinion. Yes, he did. D did he? Yeah, he kept yes. holding the balance. Yes, <laughs> about the dissenting opinion and all that. And you see, in law... C can we do it the way I have asked you? Let's, let's, you, let's go by that approach, where he ended. The theory of the witch hunt. You see, I, I, am, I am running away from <laughs> politics to dealing with law. The person is but a politically exposed speak, person. If you want me to speak politics. The person is a politically exposed person. You know person. my Current style, Samson. Politics. <laughs> Samson, you know my style. I, I, I don't want to come here and feed our viewers and listeners with politics. If we want, we'll go and buy airtime and do that. <laughs> That's not why I'm here. We are here to educate the public on the decision taken by the Court of Appeal in the matter of the Republic versus the 2000 and others. That's why we are here. But we're going to talk about politics and political witch hunt and etc. NDC officials who left office in 2016 were in their thousands. Have they all been hounded before courts? Please. So those contexts, I don't want us to, to always belabor the point and, and create the impression as if somebody is picked from home and charges profit against him and he's asked to go to court and answer. That's not the case at all. There must be a reason. I mean, of course, no smoke without fire. Something will trigger it. It may be trivial. It may be serious. You can look at the circumstances of each matter. And remember that the judgment as to the prosecution of a case or otherwise is determined by the attorney general and his staff. It's so a if, political if, decision, if, so yes, to speak. If they are convicted that... <laughs> they, are, they are supposed to prefer charges against you on the basis of a set of facts and their own analysis. They go ahead and do so. Look, there, there is so much to this case that you may not even know. No, it, it, it's come before me before. This particular matter, when I was deputy attorney general. It, it came before me. You know. And I'm being very honest with you. Damig made a determination that there was a case for a two-person to answer. That was why he went to court. Now, if you read the judgment... Let me ask, even though I know you will say it. <laughs> when it came before you, what was I am, the No, no, I, I am... Let, let, let's no, move no, ahead no, and deal with the crazy. issue. <laughs> and deal with the issue as it is, you see. When he made the determination that Atu Fosun was supposed to answer, and he went to court, indeed, the trial judge agreed with him. That was why the submission of no case was dismissed. Again, even when the appeal was made, one of the judges dissented. So those who are wishing it away as if it was a complete frivolity and that he concocted something and ran to court. So think about that. That even the court, is, the first court of instance agreed with him and even in the appeal itself, one of the justices agreed with him. The first court of instance is a sole judge. Yeah, that's you what I'm saying. The three wise men. So, so I'm saying the three the wise men. That you use. So yeah, let's keep to I the agree. Court. But you see, it, it wasn't unanimous, isn't it? There are some cases that we go to the You don't need unanimity, unanimity <laughs> to have a parliamentary approval. You don't need unanimity to make a judgment. Samson, you are running away from a basic fact that I, 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 want, to, I want to draw attention <coughs> to. When there is a dissenting opinion in every judgment, okay, sometimes it can constitute the basis for which the other party that lost will go on appeal. Then it shows us that dissenting judgment opinions <laughs> can actually become the rule. Absolutely. So the fact is that when Dami says he's going to go on appeal, we should allow him to exercise his right. If a true person did not exercise his right of appeal, will he be acquitted? That's the question. He exercised a right. He went on appeal. He got acquitted. The attorney general says that acquittal is wrong. So he's also going on appeal to the Supreme Court. <laughs> and that is why we have the Supreme Court. Sometimes I even make a comment that there are sometimes some decisions of the Supreme Court itself, if there were appellate courts above it, they also be overturned. That's a fact. I make those statements. But until the Supreme Court makes a determination on the matter, we cannot come to the conclusion that what the Court of Appeal has said is wholly 
and must not be touched. The courts, and remember that the several courts, times... The courts do have finality, but they don't have infidelity. Um, what did I want to say? Infinity. Inf <laughs> no, no, like, no, no. Like, I, like I know. I what know. they say I, is not the last. Yes. I understand you what you're talking about. Uh, Whatever decisions are, I mean, churned out by the courts, we still have the right to criticize it. Mm. You know, as, as we, we, we can run commentary and then proffer our opinions. And remember that even mm. if you read the judgment, he kept saying it in his opinion, in his opinion. In, that's his opinion that is actually enunciated. So what I'm saying is that to wish it away completely and say that there was no substance in it, it was a political witch hunt and etc. is below the belt because of the circumstances from the trial court through to the court of appeal and mm. the decision that has been taken. I wanted to say they do have finality, but not infallibility. Uh, right. of, of course. Yeah, not of infallibility. Course. Of course, <laughs> infallibility is, is not attributable to man anyway. Correct. I Correct. Mean, because we are all fallible as, as we do. We, we err as we do, and we learn every day anyway. So to come to the conclusion, as, as we, we, we want to, to, to portray, that everything right from the beginning had been frivolous and it was like a set of facts brought together to persecute him for his vociferous nature. In fact, there are more vociferous persons in the NDC than the Honorable to force. Let's stay within the four walls of the judgment now because that's what you want to do. Absolutely. I'm, I'm not going out of it. Since you want to do that, the majority opinion, what do you say? It says, it says, it says, you went attacking a person you shouldn't have attacked. Yes, I have, I have, I have. And that there is no basis whatsoever in law to have attacked that person. Let me tell you, their position uh -huh. is defensible. But it doesn't necessarily mean that I agree with them. But it is defensible. As a lawyer. You're hold, a senior hold lawyer with uh, almost 16, 17 years at the bar, correct? It, yes. Is it 17? 16. 16, 16 years 16, at the bar. Yeah. When you hear what they say, the law of princi principal and agent, when the <laughs> agent commits sins, who <laughs> is fixed with liability for the sins of the agent? No, but Generally, the, who is fixed with the, uh, the... The principal. Thank you. So that's what they have told you. Yes. Then they tell you in this case also <coughs> that... So it is BC you should have gone for and not the agent, So which you, you just confirm, you agree with. Then they tell you also that the Ministry of Finance <coughs> could not have ensured the payment. To, to, to have the payment made, it is the Ministry of Health that would have said, okay, on the basis of the LC, which has conditions, the conditions are that Big C must fulfill A, B, C, D. Big C has fulfilled A, B, C, D. Please go ahead and pay. Ministry of Health, that was their job, not the Ministry of Finance. That's, that's so what you cannot says. attack Ministry of Finance, but Ministry of Health. Do you agree or you don't? You see, what I will agree with that to a certain extent mm. only is that I think that the prosecution of the persons who are there now and who made the appeal and won the appeal, there should have been other persons added to them. My opinion is that it, it, it will not vindicate a two forcing completely but other persons would have been added to the list for prosecution who were left out. Officials of the Ministry of Health definitely were a necessary part of this, in my candid opinion. Because if you look at the arrival of the vehicle, the defects that were detected, and then the pre-shipment and all that, the inspections that were supposed to be conducted, it wasn't that two forcing who was supposed to do that. It was supposed to be the Minister of Health. And if that was not done, yes. and, and satisfied as having been done, yes. payment would not be made. Yes, of, of, of course. So it means that some people in the ministry there were supposed to answer, clearly. So I think the list of accused persons were not exhaustive enough. So why was it? It wasn't exhaustive. Nolly Prosequi entered against the chief director. I think he was, he he was, was, very, he was sick. very sick. He was very sick. He just could not avail himself okay. to stand okay. trial. Okay. You know, but there were more other persons in the ministry there who ought to have been, whose roles, as far as it relates to inspection of um, the vehicles and etc., ought to have been done that they didn't do. So, who's so answer? now step down. Yes. <laughs> Some people in the Ministry of Health ought to be held accountable, as far as you are concerned. So you agree. Now, will there even be a liability when the Ministry of Health agrees with Big C that, look, the defect we brought to your attention, you, Big C, you say that we should have come to 
wherever it was to inspect. We waited for it to come to Ghana. You have already shipped them. And now we agree. We are going to rectify the effects. Ministry of Health says, I agree with you. We'll rectify the defects. Then the big C ships to you what you require to rectify the defect. You haven't done that. It's their liability in the first place. No, first of all, where, where um, all the ambulances supplied? This is in respect of the 30. Yeah, that's, that's what, that's what I'm For saying. which see, there was a payment see, of 2.37 million. Hold on. Mm. The uh, three point, um, I think the entire amount was about three point something million. Oh, 16. Yes. So the, the fundamental question we should be asking ourselves at this stage is, what was supplied? Was it commensurate with the amount of money that was paid? That's the first question we should ask. More valuable if it wasn't, space. then there was a level of loss that was occasioned, mm -hmm. clearly. And I'm saying that if a level of uh, uh, loss was actually occurred, and you're talking about shipment of items and etc. by the uh, principal party, to Ghana to remedy the defects. And that, that one will bring us to some civil liability, mm -hmm. and et cetera, and no, no criminal consequences. But the criminal consequences are basically as a result of the fact that the conduct by the judgment of the attorney had led to losses to the state, which ought to have been presented. And, and hold on, hold on. The attorney general also, his argument from day one has been that whatever triggered all these processes and circumstances and leading us to where we are, was well, that letter that was written by Atu Fosin. Exactly, that's his point. That yeah. is his point. Mm. It's from, right from day one. Yeah. He says that if that letter of credit was, uh, letter was not written for the letter of credit to be issued, the irrevocable letter of credit to be issued, we will not even be where we are. Do you think all. that's a good so argument to make? He's looking at the root. No, let's stay He's looking at the root. No, let's stay there. Do you agree <laughs> with that kind of argument? That, but for the issuance of the uh, request for the letter of credit, yes. Payment would not have the happened. contract itself would not have even been executed because it's a condition precedent. No, it would not no. have been executed. The letter of the letter of credit, yes, it's a guarantee. We all agree, yes. The, and it is the, the reason of the state agree that the letter of credit is only a guarantee. That, that's, that, that's 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 and that there are conditions to fulfill before the letter of credit will become liquid, correct? Absolutely. So that's what I'm saying. I'm saying so, that. So do you agree I'm that, saying that by requesting the letter of credit, hold on. you should Big be held C. responsible? First of all, Big C mm. would not have entered into the contract and executed same mm -hmm. if the letter of credit was not issued. Ah, I think the contract was The contract was That, that is the fundamental thing. I'm talking about the letter of credit was done. If, if the letter, let, oh, the let, the, please, if, ah. Sam, Sammy, okay. you see, I want us to be civil. Mm. You know, when you started from the beginning to the end, I never interrupted you. Oh, second. sorry, sorry. And I don't like that. You see, when the letter of credit was issued, mm -hmm. it was the basis on which Big C went into the main execution of the contract. And you know that most of the contracts that we enter into in government circles, I mean, to be able to prove to the other contract that it's a credible arrangement you are making and all that, and that they, they shouldn't be afraid, they will not lose, and etc. Letters of credit are issued. And I'm saying that the mm. process that led to where we are today was that letter written on this issue of irrevocable letters of credit. That's Some the beginning. Some will ask you the question. And I'm saying Hold that on. the attorney general. Hold on. Some will ask you a question. That, Some will ask you this that, question. And look, I'm pushing so we can get our audience very clear on this issue. Some will ask you the question. Attorney general, should it be prosecuting itself? Because remember what triggered the LC. What was it? Attorney General's advice. Correct? Of course. So, that Attorney General, if you, the Attorney on. General, if you, if you write an opinion, an advice to uh, Minister of Finance, and you say, look, you have entered into this contract. The other party is doing something. You have not done something. So, something can happen. And you write advice to uh, Minister of Finance. Do you expect them to disobey it? We don't expect them to disobey. If they obey it, you sue the Minister of Finance or you sue yourself? No, you see, I'm saying that you don't expect them to disobey. Correct. But whatever you do must not be reckless. Mm -mm. And the Attorney General is establishing that Attorney the Attorney General says the, the people conduct, have a case. The conduct of the actors in no, writing no, that stay letter. stay here, stay here. The Attorney General says the people have a case. So go ahead and do what has to be done. Minister of Finance says, makes a request, issue letter of uh, credit. So where did it originate? Did it originate from the Ministry of Finance or the Attorney General? All right, so the, first, the other question you should be asking yourself is, the Attorney General does not so much to issue those uh, instructions. You are not answering my I'm question. I'm saying the Attorney General does not so much to issue those things. Mm. Somebody has to trigger it, okay. the Attorney General. Mm -hmm. You have to actually elevate it to that level before you get that response that comes. 
So the question we should ask further is, how did the Attorney General get seized with that information that led them to that advice that they gave? Okay. That's a fundamental so question. I'm, I'm, I, I ask Otherwise, that question. you narrowly limit it to the fact that the Attorney General proffered that advice. I asked that it, question was it in respect as a busy, of your busy argument. In, was it in, as in as respect of your argument about tracing liability to the initiator. Yeah. That's why I asked that question. So you and I'm saying you, that I'm you saying are that my lawyer. You are my lawyer. I think you are. You, are, you are missing. You are giving me advice. Something you are missing. That I should you are do something. The point. I do the thing, and you come and say I should be. I'm held saying you are missing the point. Uh -huh. I'm saying that the point that is being made by the attorney general. Mm -hmm. You may not agree with him, but that is his point. That the originator of that letter that led to the LC is the cause of the whole conundrum. I'm saying you may not agree with him. Who but advised? That is his who advised? Who advised? It's, it's the Attorney General who, who advises. So, and I'm so, saying that that is his case. Uh -huh. You may not agree with him, but that's the point he's putting across. <laughs> Firstly, in fact, if you listen to Godfrey Dami mm. from the beginning mm -hmm. all the way to now, even the day before yesterday and yesterday when I was listening to him, okay. it, it is very clear in his mind that mm. the reason why he's pursuing this matter is because of the origin of that letter mm. that led to the LC that was established. Do you believe that's the case? Do you believe there's opportunity for civil recovery if the something like that. No, but you see, that one is subject to the Limitations Act. And, okay. and my brother has stated it. And if you look at the time, unless certain uh, concrete steps were taken and certain processes were initiated that did not allow you to sleep over your right to allow limitations to catch up with you and etc. If you go to court, you'll be thrown out. Mm. You know, that's one of the, uh, the problems that we have in this particular matter. You but as I about, said... You spoke about I said, seeing some civil liability. Yes. Rather than criminal liability. Yes, at, at the beginning, I made that point. So and we still, have lost it. I still stand by it, but I'm talking about the timelines. So we have lost it as a state. Of course. And that is why the Attorney General says, look, once the Court of First Instance had agreed with me, the Court of Second Instance says, no, I'll go to the Supreme Court. If they agree with uh, the, 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 the... Why do we the, waste the state's money appellant. to go to the Supreme Court again after how many years when you, sitting from where you sit with all this benefit, believe that it is more of civil than criminal liability? No, you see, what, what, what I have said, if you understood me from the beginning, I'm saying that, yes, there are elements of it, very large elements of it, that we could have initiated civil processes if we were interested in recovering money. Okay. There's no doubt about it. But I'm saying that that does not also uh, derogate from the fact right. that we were criminal. But, and remember something, mm -hmm. just a last, a last bit of it. All right. Look at the amount of money that was paid to Jakwa. I think about 700,000 euros. If you calculate it percentage-wise, 28% of the contract sum. How much was the profit margin that 28% of the entire contract sum was paid to somebody? Mm. That's a reckless conduct. Ah. On the part of the arrangement, it means that it was just an arrangement to cause loss to the state. Because if you look at the whole arrangement, if 700,000 could be paid to one person in the circumstances that it was done as just an agent and not the principal, then God save us. Right. So now let's come here. Um, Savia, I know you are there and there's a portion you are coming in to close us about the Attorney General statement he issued, which some of you don't like and you are also criticizing him for issuing that statement in that tone. But I do this job and I lose friends and I win some. I'll still go on. <laughs> I asked the question the last time. What do you say? There was plea bargain. And we understand that the plea bargain, it was Big C, the principal, mm. that was seeking to pay two million out of the 2.37 million. The Attorney General refused. The plea bargain. <laughs> plea bargain can be accepted. Doesn't mean you won't be found, you won't be held guilty. You may just lose uh, going to jail, mm. or you get reduced sentence, mm. or something of the sort. Mm. My question is presently, we have lost. We've spent money, and we have lost completely. You don't think the Attorney General has cost us? Financial loss? 
Me? Yes. <laughs> I, I think that will be a stretch. A stretch in Come, the sense Why that didn't you ask me this question? <laughs> <laughs> or you a repeat stretch, the question? A stretch in the sense that he made a professional call. Now, for me, I, 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 if the Attorney General had accepted the plea bargain in the manner that it was presented, he would have been breaching law. Because plea bargain must be by the accused persons. No. And they must first agree to plead guilty. Not you, always. Even the plea bargain act, you should not plead, plead guilty no. first. No. Because it can actually lead to dropping charges. Yes, but what I mean, in the, in the course of the discussions or the negotiation, there must be an admission of liability before no. you pay. No. No, no, I'm not like necessarily going to court to say that I now plead guilty. But if you have not, where are you going to get the money from to come and pay? I, I thought that once the offer was made, perhaps it could have been done in a civil action where it could have been terms of settlement. If you were the attorney general. Yes. If you were the attorney general. Yes. You are prosecuting a case of uh, 2.37 2. 2. million euros. Yes. And there is 2 million euros mm -hmm. available for you to mm -hmm. collect mm -hmm. and still get something. What would be your first reaction? I'll be interested in the money. Because mm. the whole idea is to make sure that the state that you start causing financial loss. Mm. So, so if there's an in opportunity. In the loose sense of it. Sorry? In the loose sense yes, of it. So if there's Not an in the criminal sense of yes, it. Yes, so if there's an opportunity for the state to get money, I'll be interested in it. And then it brings to for the, the argument of what was the focus of this prosecution <laughs> right from the beginning. Because if it was in, an, in, in a manner that you wanted to retrieve money, the principal has said, I'm ready to pay $2 million. You could have gone through the legal framework. I would have pursued a civil action if they said, and you can do terms of settlement in a civil action. Within one month, two months, you get, it's, it's written that at least you have done something, you have collected money are you, are you back by, to the state. Are you by this lending yourself to the suggestions that the Attorney General was up to persecute I, and, not, I, I, and not working oh, in the interest of the state. Can expect him to answer this? Please, please, <laughs> let him talk. I think that would be a stretch. <laughs> Some of his utterances perhaps would have lent credence mm -hmm. to, the, to, the, to that argument. Mm. But, you know, these are matters that you need to establish intention right from the beginning. And I'm not in his mind. I would have said that, like, like, like Senior said, it is not as if they just picked him up from his house and then took, they brought evidence in their opinion, mm. should have. So they did some work. You cannot say that they just, like a kangaroo court. No, they actually put in work. Unfortunately, the Court of Appeals said the Thank work you. you have done does not meet Thank the you. threshold. Thank you. All of you answer that question no. in, oh. in one minute. Oh, you. I you yes. Let me see. Yes. Oh, no. I just <laughs> wanted to make three quick points. No, the question I asked you, I asked him, you wanted to answer it. Yeah, number one, it is clear that Godfrey Diabuadame has occasioned a huge financial loss to the state. Jesus Christ. In the sense that you see, any prosecutor who is prosecuting an offense of willfully causing financial loss to the state, your number one goal ought to be the possible recovery of the loss you allege has been located in the state. So if which, a third which party... Which criminal prosecution simpliciter may not get... Mm. Exactly, mm. exactly. Get to them so out. if a third party says that, look, without prejudice to the rise of any of the parties... This matter can impact my reputation. And so I want to pay this money to you. Mm. Your, mm. Your, your first inclination should be to accept that offer. Mm. But you see, because the objective was persecution and not prosecution, he was not interested in the recovery of the money. And please, Senior Bobby, let me correct you. Yes, the first offer did not come from a party in the case. But later on, the third accused adopted that offer. Jackpa oh, adopted it. To offer it And himself. wrote countless letters to the Attorney General. Because the Attorney General's first response was mm -hmm. that you are big C, you are not a party. Mm -hmm. You can't mm -hmm. make this offer for a okay. plea uh, uh, bargain. Mm -hmm. So then Jackpa writes to say, we are adopting the offer. So that he will then be says, And then they say the terms mm -hmm. are not acceptable. Then they write to amend the terms to make it more favorable. He says, I'm not interested. You know and the so, reason why so he did that, not accept? He said... 
until you convince Ato Forsen to join this plea bargain, I will not accept it. He, all they, the person they were looking for was Ato Forsen. Okay, thank you. That's number one. No, number two. He made a certain I need point to about to the letter. Yeah. Oh, I'll be quick. You know, I've not had any opportunity to uh, come again. On the letter, please. The agreement that was executed between Big C and the Republic imposed an obligation on the Ministry of Finance to ensure that a letter of credit was established in favor of Big C. Mm. The Ministry of Health, which was the contracting party, attempted to resolve from the agreement on grounds of financial constraints. Big C threatened to sue. It was on that basis that the Attorney General that office that you've worked there, you've worked in before, advice, and you know that advice of the Attorney General is binding on all MDAs, advice the Ministry of Finance and the Ministry of Health to perform the contract, which therefore was meant... was a difficult place when I was pushing... Exactly, which therefore meant that <laughs> that letter of credit needed to be established. So, Atul Fawcett, in writing that letter, was actually doing what was required of him in yeah, accordance with advice. the legal advice of the AG, the contract, the law. And he did not breach any law. Lastly, I want to stress, the, and, and I go back to paragraph 150 of the judgment again, that it is very clear that nobody can say that any loss has been occasioned Ghana under this transaction except the loss occasioned us by the criminal negligence of this government in refusing to clear the medical equipment you, shipped by Big C. You forget that. Mm -hmm. The equipment were not brought in the time of this government. When were yes. they brought? They were brought in, they, they were shipped in October 2016, arrived in November 2016. Why we were had they, election why were by 7th December. December. Oh, but you know that when a, a consignment like that will arrive, the Ministry of Health will have to uh, okay. put things Thank together you. before they Manka, carry I'm going to so save you on the They have had the seven Thank you. years. Thank you. Thank you. Of course. To they... clear the medical equipment right. and have them installed. All right. And they have refused. In fact, they have Thank cleared you. the equipment. Thank you. But they yes. have refused to yes, notify BC to install them. So they have Manka, occasioned that financial Manka, loss. I'm calling you if you and don't they will don't be held responsible. I'm done. So they have caused the financial loss. Imagine you were the one prosecuting, and then it's 2.4 million and you have two million cash to collect, mm -hmm. what will you do? You know, I, 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 I have stated time and again that each one of us, when we are on that hot seat, you have your own judgment on matters. And we must respect that. We are interested that. in your judgment. Hold on. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to answer that. <laughs> First of all, what is even the reason for the prosecution? It's because of financial loss. Mm -hmm. That's, that's the most fundamental reason for the prosecution. Mm. The criminal for prosecution any also effort, includes deterrence. Yeah. Yes, the deterrence, yes. Mm. Which but you can get after you think. Any it. effort yeah. yes. to get money for the state is commendable. And have we forgotten that the same attorney general has retrieved several millions of Ghana from about. convicts? We are talking about this one. No, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, so why so, but we shouldn't, we shouldn't treat it in Nobody isolation. Nobody is saying Otherwise, that we get it has wrong. not retrieved We money. get it wrong. Nobody has said that. You see, stay here, it, it stay is with because, this issue. You see, it is because of the bastardization after the judgment. That's why I'm bringing this. Okay. It's oh. because now, of that. Savia, 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 come in and please forgive me. Please bastardize Please forgive me. <laughs> so, gentlemen, gentlemen, you, gentlemen, hold on. Sami has bastardized sorry, sorry, gentlemen, gentlemen, the man. Hold on. You have used the, some words that uh, I, told you general, I, would, I would advise you never to engaging a represented party gentlemen, those gentlemen, words are outside the court gentlemen, telling you to gentlemen, lie on oath. Please, 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 please. Hold on now. Hold Sammy, on. Don't. No, no. Hold on. You would never Savia, have done this. thank you for okay. your patience. You know. Why is the GBA unhappy? that Attorney General calls this judgment perverse and that he's going to continue uh, to the Supreme Court to seek to overturn it because his conviction is that this judgment is wrong. Why are you criticizing him that he's doing something wrong? Uh, Samson, good morning again and good morning to my colleagues in the, in the studio. Samson, to, to begin with, we are not against the attorney general disagreeing with the judgment of the court, not at all. It's the choice of words and the manner in which is done it. If you read the statement issued, you realize that he was just trying to say, I disagree with this judgment, I will go on appeal. If he had just said that, 
I'm not sure we have had problems with it. But to use words like uh, zeronios, uh, is inimical, and so many others, that's where we have problems with. Because let us all be, be, uh, try to have confidence in our judicial system. If we, as lawyers, describe decisions, of course, with such strong words, what we would, what would we be saying to non-lawyers who may not appreciate the work that we do as lawyers? In the first place, I do not personally even think that there was a need for a statement after the judgment. Because all we all do, uh, Samson, you know, and those in the studio to know, we just say, if that's a decision of the court, I accept it, but I will apply, review it, and advise accordingly. I think that would have been the end of the matter. Mm. Uh, let us not create the impression as if uh, we must always win. I don't think that life is about that. Sometimes you lose, sometimes you win. So that is our concern. The concern is the words used. Okay. As a lawyer, personally, I've learned something. I don't tell lawyers they are wrong. I tell them I disagree with you because I may not have the benefits of knowing what went into your analysis of arriving at your conclusion. So it's better I tell you I disagree. I can't tell you you are wrong. But what, what's the problem with us in the use of language? In, in cross-examination, I tell people you are lying, and the judges will tell me, don't say that. Say, say that he's being untruthful. What, what's the difference? You are lying. You are being untruthful. Which is the difference? No, you know the court has a language. <laughs> you yeah. can't use certain words. You see, uh, uh, Samson, <laughs> if this were coming from a, uh, just any ordinary lawyer, some of us, I think we can be pardoned a little bit. But this is our official leader. You know, because of this, People are protesting, raising all kinds of issues. But we're telling them, come for conference. Mm. We all know mistakes. Let's give the AG time. Maybe it was just a bit emotional. That's all. Mm. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Savia. Could you, we are going to get to affirmative action and see what might happen. Uh, but I've been asking myself, what is our problem with ambulances? What's wrong with us? Eh? Can we go ourselves and buy the ambulances direct? Than use third parties and get into trouble. Now there's the another real, ambulance. The real, that is a real there's one. Another ambulance matter real. on the table, uh, and let's be let's be clear that it is not the case that if this case had ended at the high court, the verdict or the judgment would have been, been that they would have been, been they would have been yeah. found guilty. No, it is yeah. very possible that they could have been found not guilty at the end of the trial, yeah. and. Uh, the, 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 what do you call, the service Ghana 1-2, all issues being raised. Of course, we are seeing uh, statements that they are oh. issuing, uh, s s telling us a few other things. But for, Which is worsening the matter. No, I don't think it worsens it. Oh, if we really? take our time and we look at the facts, mm -hmm. maybe it might help us. For example, the first time they say that uh, the impression was given that it was a sole source contract, mm -hmm. but it's come clear that it was competitive. Okay. 16 companies involved. Seven eventually became a, a consortium and did it. There was claim that there was no value for money. They showed that there was value for money because their price was the lowest bid, about 130, mm -hmm. and there was up to 300 from some other companies. The source and source theirs part was the was less. No, the source, source part. Several other things. The source source part had to do with the contract for the maintenance and servicing. Correct. Not the procurement of the ambulances Correct. itself. Correct. And that one. It's still so soft. They, yeah. They've not counted that. No, no, no. But it's it's not. That, that's what they are saying. The maintenance? That's, that's what they are saying. No. And, the, and the, the, the amount was attributed to as if a short period. They said it's five years period of maintenance no. of that amount. No. And they are saving the country about 50 Unfortunately, uh, you don't have time. But US dollars. Or not at all. Million, yeah, 50 million don't, dollars. Don't, don't, no, no, not at all. What they are saying. Every coin has two sides. No. Yes. This this particular queen mm -hmm. has only one side. <laughs> right, and, and that side is this. That side is <laughs> All right, this. So the spare parts, we'll parts for an ambulance. We'll right back. Spare side. parts for an ambulance cannot be more expensive than the ambulances. Okay, so that's where you get it wrong because if you, do, you don't listen to their explanation. What are they saying? You should listen. I've listened, I've read because this. You are, you are attributing a cost to one ambulance and they are telling you that it's a five year uh, period of maintenance. It's mm -hmm. not just for a year or something. Oh, and, and, they are and, and, and the, and the so finance many. minister was already okay, paid. Okay, so let's go. That's not the issue you we are discussing. This. We'll be right back. And as asked that... That the Affirmative Action Gender Equity Bill 2024 be now... Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
I beg to move that the affirmative action Gender Equity Bill 2024 be now read for the third time. Thank you, Mr. Smith. I so move. Thank you. Affirmative action Gender Equity Act 2024. I put a question. Honorable members, those in favor of the third reading of the bill, say aye. aye. Those against, say no. Honorable members, the ayes have it. The affirmative action Gender Equality Bill 2024, Bill 2024, now Affirmative Action Gender Equity Act 2024, duly read the third time and passed. An act to provide affirmative action for gender equity in the public and in the public and private sectors and for related matters. Welcome back. This is News File, it's your most authoritative news analysis platform. And here on News File, we put Ghana first. Uh, just a couple of messages for you, and then we go into affirmative action. Um, I'll tell my friends here, the women, about some stories that maybe hmm, what affirmative action will do, we have no idea yet. I know of some constituencies where the women outnumber the men in every respect. Go to the University of Ghana Law Faculty and go and find out. They have recorded 70% or more of women. <laughs> uh, all right, so this one from al Haj Suleiman. He says, uh, after reading the judgment, I felt so angry. Why are we treating our country this way? It's all politics at the detriment of Ghana, clearly, there was no basis to charge at forcing and that the ambulances were salvageable, but they deliberately left them to rot just to make a case against at forcing. The judges point to that, or at worst, people at the Ministry of Health were rather liable. Somehow, it makes me believe Japan's accusations against the AG. It's really sad, and I'm disappointed in Gofredami and this government. Uh, okay, so this one says that plea bargain is only between the parties in a criminal matter. Big C was not a party to begin with. As part of a judgment in a criminal trial, a judge can make an order for restitution, an order, an, an, i.e. order an accused person to pay back the money to the victim or further punishment in lieu of, um, okay, this is from Wilba. Thank you. Uh, Yakubu Ibn Chambas says, in as much as it might seem, the Attorney General is bruised by the Court of Appeal and embarrassed in the public domain, he should be proud of his boldness and determination to protect the state coffers. He must be minded that his integrity and reputation are intact. The enthusiasm of the Attorney General to have rushed to the court for a possible prosecution of perceived corruption case should be appreciated. In any case, the courtroom is not a guaranteed grounds for expectations. You lose or you win. Uh, this one, Buama says, just abusing the judicial process. That is what it is. Musa Abatoa says, uh, Sami Jemfi has done a commendable job in breaking down the complexities of the abundance uh, case, ambulance case you meant to write, making it accessible to the every 
day person. However, what concerns me deeply is not just the strong language he used, but the apparent uh, mess. Okay, you want me to be um, Stephen Amwa, eh? I don't know how to pronounce these long words. <laughs> An attempt to prosecute and to persecute and imprison innocent people like Ato Forcing and others at all costs. This is a, a worrying thing, an unjust act that should alarm all who value fairness in the society. Uh, a Rabna Opoku says that Attorney General should have pursued the contracting company and not the agent. Yeah, that's what the court says. I don't think it's a political witch hunt. We should pursue it and retrieve the taxpayers' money. That brings up a big question that we answered for you. Uh, in a serious country, the Minister, of, uh, the Minister of Attorney General and Justice should have resigned immediately. Dr. Atuforsing was acquitted and discharged by the appeal court. Looking at all that have transpired between Richard Jakpa and Godfrey Dame, okay, Ghana is unwell. Okay, thanks for your messages. Uh, maybe just this one more. A layman question. What happens to the High Court judge who seems not to have applied themselves to fidelity of the law? Shouldn't they be marked as what? No. That's what happens. Everybody gives a decision. That's why there's, there are layers of the court. If you don't, you are not happy, you go to the next stage. That's what it, it is. Thank you very much. So now, let's come to... Affirmative action. So, uh, we want to apologize sincerely to our radio audience for the intermittent, intermittent breaks that you have suffered. Um, forgive us, it is the internet that has been this unhelpful. But thank you for staying with us. And I'm delighted, very delighted, to have in the studio Sheila Menka Premo. Lawyer and Convener, Affirmative Action Bill Coalition. What a relief you must be sighing. After how many years? To the point, you actually smuggled part of this bill into the land law. <laughs> <laughs> because you didn't see it happening. Well, I wouldn't say we didn't see it happening. We knew eventually it would happen. It did take a very long time. Right. You know, more than 13, what? Yeah, over 13 years. For us to get here. So we are very elated, very okay. happy that the bill eventually passed. Great, great. So Sheila Minka Premo has been one of the people in the background. They do a lot. They don't talk about it. And here in the studio also is the lady who is uh, shaking grounds <laughs> with uh, some new development as far as her advocacy is concerned. Shamima Muslim, <clears throat> member of the NDC communication team. Uh, she has been a gender activist for a very long time and also leading women's uh, progress in the media landscape. Thank you, Shamima, for making time to join Thank us. Thank you, my brother. Yeah. Uh, how many seminars do you remember you have been over this affirmative action, babe, over the period? I think uncountable. <laughs> Uncountable. I think that the whole and uh, women's representation and presentation debate and safety transcends the affirmative action bill. All I right. think I was a young graduate in mm. 2003 when I started work with Legal Resources Center and I was put on the Domestic Violence Coalition mm. with my senior. So okay. people don't know where the passion comes from. It comes from the opportunity to have worked with people and being in spaces like them that really, you know, honed the advocacy and the passion for the issues. Because very soon, I came close to very at close contact with germane issues that were real that I could relate to from my background, you know, as as a, a young Northern Muslim girl. And so, mm. yes, it's been a long time coming. And what I know for sure is that every right that women enjoy today, they have had to claim. They have had to claim them right. from the actions and mobilizing of the women's movement in Let's Ghana. Go. Let's go into the meet shortly. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, and then former attorney, Deputy Attorney General is still here with us, uh, Dimdio Kwenka, Bobby Banson, um, also a lawyer and author of two legal texts on civil procedure and commercial arbitration. Now, I'll start with Sheila. So, yes, 
room for celebration. Yes, it's been two decades. Yes. But we know what this country, what happens. <laughs> it's not the passage of the law. It is the implementation of the law. We have all the beautiful laws. So the Affirmative Action Bill Coalition, which is made up of a number of CSOs that came together to push for this law, the objective we set for ourselves are twofold. One is to push to have the law. And once the law is enacted, we would also push to ensure that it is effectively implemented. Um, as um, Shamima indicated, I have, I have a history with a similar objective, which was to push for the Domestic Violence Act. Mm -hmm. Afterwards, we worked together with the ministry, developed the implementing legislation, and did other things with them right. to ensure that the law worked. Mm -hmm. So it's the same kind of energy that we are bringing to this law. Mm -hmm. Having had it passed, I mean, having helped to push to have it passed, we would also help with implementation. Right. We will work with the ministry um, in developing the relevant um, regulations or, or legislative instruments required for it. Um, one of the things that is supposed to be done is to come up with a plan of action to ensure that the, 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 this is supposed to be developed by the Gender Equity Committee that is responsible for the, for the law. We also work first to ensure that this, as early as possible, this committee is put together. Mm -hmm. One of their key activities is to come up with a plan of action. We we'll would also work with them. We'll, 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 go, the we'll go into aspects or salient aspects of the law shortly. The, yes, but first, what's the justification for it, particularly at this time? And I'm going back to my example. The University of Ghana is such a beautiful example to use. The leadership of the University of Ghana, from VC, from uh, Chancellor, VC, Registrar, name them. And, and the heads of departments littered with women. And I'm saying, in one particular school, mm. at one point, over 70% women. I think that this, uh, this is one, I don't know whether I would call it a positive development mm -hmm. in our history. And it's a rarity. Yeah. On the other hand, in most of these um, public universities, if you're using public universities as an example, Majority of the leadership is, is male. It just happens that currently at the University of Ghana, yes, the chair, the vice chancellor, etc., many of them are women. And I, I believe that I don't, I'm not too sure whether it was intentional to, for it to reflect in that way. But whatever happened that the key leaders there are female, it's, 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 for me, it's a credit to the competence of those women who are out there. Right. Because they, were not, they are also not there just because they are women, but because these are very capable women who have worked some in the public sector for a long time, some in other sectors, and were appointed based on pure merit. Therein it lies my question. Therein lies my question. Yes. What's the justification for this? Shouldn't women get to where they mass on merit? Yes, women must get to where they are based on merit, but we live in a patriarchal community. In a, you know, we live in a culture where Basically, the headship of men is what is the norm. That is the norm. And therefore, women who are even qualified and who want to occupy certain positions have challenges in you know, either aspiring to get there, etc. cetera. Um, a lot of women, for instance, who are very capable, have basic education, some even more tertiary education, very qualified, who want to go to parliament. It is very difficult because you have to go and campaign on platforms in communities where they don't see you as a natural leader. Hmm. And a lot of insults are held at you. If you're not married, then, excuse me to say, you're labeled as an Ashawa woman. If you're married, I've been told, some of them are asked, have you finished organizing your home hmm. before you had the platform seeking to come and represent us? So people don't naturally see women as leaders. And a lot of obstacles are put in their way. And therefore, um, it was necessary to have legislation because I think you're asking about the justification. This is justified. Yeah. One of the key justifications for this law is in our own constitution, Article 17 of our constitution. Yeah. Article 17, first of all, says there should be no discrimination on the basis of gender. It defines what gender is, etc. But 17.4 is very clear. Mm. It says that where historically it's been found that there's been discrimination in certain sectors against one gender, there is nothing wrong if parliament passes a law to bring in policies and programs to address the imbalance. And this is what this law is seeking to do. I'll also mention um, 35, 5 and 6, 
where it says that in recruitment into public offices, regional as well as gender considerations should be taken into consideration. So the whole thing is talking about balance, okay? And like I said, because a lot of studies, existing studies, shows that when it comes to leadership positions, there are fewer women in leadership positions as compared to men. This legislation is seeking to sort of put strategies in place to let this happen in a, in, in a, in a more um, maybe strategic way. And this is the same steps that other countries have taken. Many countries, both Western, but I would like to use um, 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 examples within the African continent. Many countries that have seen a lot of women in leadership, it was through legislation that they used to ensure that this happened. And for me, one of the classic areas where you see the numbers of women is very low, which is in parliament. Out of our 275 member parliament, <laughs> only 40 are women, making it 14.5. The UN, which Ghana belongs to, Ghana is a member of the, of, the, of the United Nations, has indicated that minimum threshold when it comes to gender representation is 30%. We are way below. In Ghana, the highest we've ever had is 18.5. And this was in 1965. After we had the first affirmative action law in 1960, when we became yeah. a republic, and um, the then president pushed to have this um, um, representation of the People's Act, which brought in 10 women. People saw the women working and could see that women could also be leaders. Yeah. And therefore, at the next election, people voted for women. And I'm sure that if uh, the democracy hadn't been interrupted with the coup d'etat, I am sure naturally we would have progressed to a level where we would have reached that level where the competency, they'll look at your competency and not just your sex. So this law is necessary to propel, to enable us to, to, to ensure that The Constitution that in the Directive Principles of State Policy mm. makes a requirement for the balance in gender. That's it. The politicians have not lived up to it. That's the constitution, yes. the supreme law of the land. Yes. What's the guarantee that they will live up to a statute, an inferior oh. legislation, so to speak? There is no, well, you know, constitutional provisions, sometimes it's difficult to apply them directly, okay? That is why acts of parliament are prepared to ensure that it picks up provisions from the constitution that needs to be actualized mm -hmm. to give a leg to what work. So for me, since this document went to parliament, they have looked at it, they have seen the need to have something like that in our, in, our, in, our, in our country. I believe that they will comply with it. This is an act initiated, yes, by the executive, went through the, the parliamentary process. They have seen the wisdom in having such a law. I believe that they, will, they, they, they would comply. Mm. I believe strongly that they will comply with it. Initially, it was to go under a certificate of uh, urgency. Mm -hmm. And the speaker says, no, I want to have broader consultation and input into it so it won't go through that way. You are a bit disappointed. You Has know, anything changed? We've, we've been doing a lot of lobbying. So mm. we've been in and out of parliament, mm. both you know, lobbying individual people, etc. One of the things, after it was laid under the certificate of urgency in um, October, one of the um, bodies, so we, we, we saw that it was referred to the Gender and Children Committee. And um, they indicated that they had looked at, they themselves indicated that they had looked at the law mm. and they needed more input from outside. And therefore, they didn't think it was going to be possible to use the certificate of agency, which required them to sort of handle the law themselves and, and push it. We then saw the speaker, you know, also trying to get an explanation as to what was going on. And he was also very clear that the nature of this law was such that they needed input, they needed stakeholders to bring in um, their own views and perspectives. So after that conversation, we as a coalition understood what the dynamics were. And we also realized, having seen the bill, that the bill itself had a few challenges at that time with it. And we thought that this was an opportunity for us to then also contribute and make an input and work together with Parliament and the, and the Ministry mm. to ensure that this law got passed. So it was an initial um, shock, but upon further reflection mm -hmm. and upon talking to the relevant committees and the, the members of Parliament, we realized that maybe it was, it was the wisest thing to do. Okay. And it gave us an opportunity to work together with that committee that um, was mandated to consider the bill and to help to, 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 to make our input and then you know, engage with them. Right. Um, I'll return to you, but Shamima, mm -hmm. which portions of this law give you so much excitement? 
<laughs> There's no excitement because I am practical enough to recognize that um, the, the real work actually begins from today. Um, the, the vision for me, what is fundamental and significant for me is that even though we have a largely watered down version of the previous editions and an expanded you know, framing of what the marginalizations or who the mar marginalized groups are. So it goes beyond just women and the, the removal of women as a primary reference in the bill to other disadvantaged, underrepresented groups. Even though the original intent was typically um, a women's bill because that is where the gaps, the historical gaps have, have been to the extent that a parliament, a national assembly has finally at least um, agreed that such a law is important to exist is, is a good starting point for me. So it's, it's a good first step that the recognition has happened, albeit there are existing uh, challenges and appreciation with the concepts and ideologies and you know, um, the, the, the justifications you know, for a woman's bill. And some express fear that are we not creating a society where into the near future men will become disadvantaged. This is why I think that one of the major things we should do almost as at now, and I'll do a bit of it now in terms of the public education, is to situate the conceptual understanding of the mandates, mm. okay, of, of what the law intends to achieve. And I'm happy where you started. You started off giving us the uh, rare example of University of Ghana, my alma mater. And that is exactly the reason why it is justified to have it. You would know that University of Ghana has had affirmative action policies for a long time now to ensure that persons or students from disadvantaged communities get entrance women and girls get entrance, but for that affirmative action, we wouldn't have had the numbers of females coming into the university as we currently have, or the numbers of persons of disability who have come into the university as we currently have, or the numbers of um, um, students from across some of our communities which are really Would you say you are, you are an outlier? I, I, saw in, I saw you in the University of Ghana. Yes. From level 100. Yes. You... You, you took advantage of all the opportunities you yes, had. Yes, I did. And we all knew you on campus yes. for advocacy work on Radio Universe and the rest of them. There was nothing that stopped you, you from see, being who you wanted to be. But, 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 but uh, huh, today I was on, on, on Metro television, and that's one of the issues we need to address, the narrative that what is stopping people. I am an outlier because I had opportunities you know, that built my confidence. You talked about Radio Universe. I went to Holy Child School, and I am an outlier because my father left Upper West, Wa, to come to the South to hustle. My grandmother had not sat in the classroom before, but she took my mom to school in Tamale when she was there. My mom started school in Tamale. My grandmother, who had never been to school, took my mother to school. And today, see where I am. You know, so had, had my dad not come, had my dad not invested in education, you know, as a Muslim man, because traditionally we all know some of the considerations around the issues of girl-child education, mm. I wouldn't be here. And so my story could have been the story of thousands more Shamimes, had they had similar opportunities. So when we come into even the university, feeling you always sometimes... You know, a space can make you feel comfortable and confident to want to express yourself. Or you could feel um, like you, what do they call this thing? Like you are an, a, an outcast of some sort. And you know those self-censoring things which require interventions in confidence building, public speaking. And I was lucky because I started Radio Universe. Until Radio Universe, I didn't know I had any skills to be in, on radio. But I walked myself into Radio Universe because something, Alaji Sadiq came to speak to us at orientation. And these are the reasons why representation is such a very powerful tool to me because I saw him as a Muslim coming to speak to us. I felt confident to walk to Radio Universe immediately after that session when we closed. I felt confident to walk to Radio Universe and to ask 
what are the modalities to volunteer here? And I was asked to go and write a letter and come, which I did. It is important for people to see people who look like them, who come from similar backgrounds as them, in positions of power and influence. When we went to Tamale, because of radio, the kinds of stories that have emerged singularly, because I decided to come and sit on radio and TV and speak, the stories of young Muslim girls who today aspire to be in journalism. Go to GIJ and see the numbers of young Muslim girls who have come. Some write to me because they say they saw me and they knew that they also could. So we must never underestimate the power of, of, of representation mm. and optics. It matters. And so the University of Ghana is a good example of how when opportunity is given, and opportunity is taken. I know opportunity needs to be given, but it also has to be taken. And when opportunity is given, yes, competence would always trump any other thing. And this is not talking about appointing women who are not competent. So we need to understand that the entire equality debate, and I have some slides I will show mm. uh, you know, after if you give me the time, right. is not a disadvantage to men, mm. neither is it a disadvantage to men's progress. But it is a call for all of us to see how do we redistribute our collective opportunities, mm. our collective resources, so that we can give meaning to our, our constitution, which envisages a society of non-discrimination mm. on the basis of sex, on the basis of class, on the basis of religion, on the basis of any other you know, avenues of discriminations. The Constitution sees all of us as bona fide members of a society who should have access to our shared you know, resources and should be able to aspire to be in any space whatsoever. Mm. So um, you've just been listening to Sheila Minka Premo. Uh, Sheila Minka Premo is a senior lawyer and uh, she's lawyer and convener Affirmative Action Bill Coalition. You just also heard Shamima Muslim who is a member of the NDC communications uh, team and a gender activist. Um, gender activists used to lead, <laughs> used to lead the, the communication <laughs> council. So uh, let me do this. Uh, I've seen one of the men putting their hand up. I'm sorry, you're not going to speak yet. Ooh. I'll take a quick break. When I return, I when I return, you see, you see the balance. Uh, when I return, <laughs> Sheila, will take us through her favorite three provisions. Shamima will do the same before we hear from the men. And the men will speak very briefly. We'll be right back. Welcome back. A news file is brought to you by Bank of Africa. As strong as a group and close as a partner, MTN everywhere you go. Ashasi University, educating ethical and entrepreneurial leaders for Africa. Robert and Sons Optical Services, your comprehensive eye care service provider for 33 plus years. My way. Insurance, dial star 165. Hash on MTN to join my way today. Syntex tanks, it's strong, it's tough. Flamingo paints, simply superior. Yes, so Sheila, let's hear what will be your favorite three provisions of this act. <laughs> okay, so there's a provision which deals with governance and decision making in the public service. And it indicates that the government is to ensure progressive, equitable representation of women in public office in governance and decision making. So it mentions you know, uh, ministerial po um, positions um, at the Council of State, independent constitutional bodies, governing bodies of state institutions, public service, business assemblies. So they're supposed to be guided by, 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 by the provisions of this yeah. act. Yeah. So the governing bodies of these institutions are supposed to ensure that in filling vacancies for positions of authority and decision making in these um, institutions, you know, um, um, gender is taken into consideration. Mm. My other one too is gender budgeting. So it says that all the relevant institutions, when they are budgeting, they should take consciously and sure that they consider both the needs of men and women when making their budgets to ensure that their needs are addressed. Then um, gender, um, because it's also in private sector, I find it also very interesting 
It says that within private sector institutions, they're supposed to have gender policies mm -hmm. so that they consciously think about gender issues when they are employing, when they are promoting, when they are doing the rest and of the And there's incentive for that, there for private sector. For that. I find it very interesting. Mm. So there are incentives for that, which is there are some tax incentives, mm -hmm. as well as for those who apply for government, um, government um, contracts, etc. They have to have what we call a gender compliance certificate, mm. which is supposed to be issued once annually you are complying with it. So I find it... I find these clauses very interesting. Okay. Um, the portion about the f your first one about progressive and ensure, you know, that kind of balance, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's already in the Constitution anyway, and it's not being complied with. Um, so this time, if the state doesn't comply with it, what happens? Um, so basically, you know, there are targets at the back. So th the way this law is structured, it's not like once it starts working, pam, you hit 50%. Okay. It is an, you, you walk the equity road mm -hmm. until you get equality, which is the, the benchmark. And because the Constitution talks about getting a balance, once it reaches, reaches equality, the idea is that the program in place will stop. Oh, okay. Yes, it is, mm. it's not one of those perpetual ones where eventually mm. they would say that women will come and overtake men. No, the, the, once there's balance, it stops. Okay. So there's a, the, the target it starts from 30%. Um, I think they're doing the review. First it was 30, 40, then we hit by 20, 30 where the UN says that sustainable development goal says that it should have reached parity, then it will stop. Mm. In doing the changes it went through in parliament, I think they changed the, 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 it from 30 to 35, and it's sort of gradual. So the idea is progressive. Mm. That is how it's been designed as. Be before Shamima comes in. Sorry, before, just yeah, okay, go ahead. Answer your question. Go ahead. So if they don't comply, what happens? Mm -hmm. First of all, the body that has been set up, reports can be made to them. Okay. So they take investigations and to come up with reports. Um, to insist, you know, to push to order a particular institution to ensure compliance. If that fails, or if an individual is directly affected, they can go to Shraj mm -hmm. to lodge a complaint. If it's labor related, they can go to the National Labor Commission. Then, um, whoever is not satisfied with the outcome on any of these institutions can go to the courts, the high courts, to, to, to initiate an action. We, are, we remember one of the issues that actually delayed this, uh, the passage was the Tony issue of uh, cohabitation. Has it been resolved? Cohabitation has nothing to do with this law. This okay. Law. Totally yeah, nothing to do with this law. Okay. Maybe spousal rights. Cohabitation was in Under the spousal rights. rights of Correct. Correct. Spousal rights. So cohabitation has nothing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Right. Shamima, <laughs> your favorite. <laughs> uh, yeah, because already we, we have a lot of work to do to okay. try and get... Yeah. You know, so for me, um, the, the areas for, the, um, for moving forward that we must look at are uh, the people, the structures, and the systems, okay? The people are all the stakeholders that would need to come on the same page to ensure that we get a full operationalization of the law. The structures that on which, you know, the various provisions are to be activated and the systems that will ensure compliance, monitoring, evaluation, and you know, implementing the system of rewards. So I do like the system of rewards, but it looks like the the law is quite heavy on punitive, you know, sanctions as against more rewards. This uh, the entire spirit is like a moral situation sort of. But we we need to be find ways of enforcing it beyond just morally swaying people and actors to take decisions because there's the science to the benefits of a more equitable society where all of its members, men, women, able, disabled, mm. are all you know, contributing um, beyond their, their minimum. One of the areas worth applauding for me, again, is the strategies for gender equality in relation to public services, including periodically updating directory of qualified women from which appointments should be made. And that's it, I think, in clause three and the fourth schedule. One of the major things we always hear, where are the women, where are the women? So the women are there, that this directory will be very helpful. Even in the media, you ask when we complain about um, panels that are male dominated, we'll get a pushback that we don't find the women. Mm. So we need mm -hmm. such a directory of qualified women. We need various public institutions to periodically publicize spaces where glass ceilings opportunities for glass ceilings to be broken. We want to break glass ceilings and we need to have the audits of organizations to see where they are in terms of the inclusion and diversity agenda, whether it's the security agencies, judiciary, parliament, 
Parliament, the provisions around, you know, politics. The is judiciary some, is another place yes. where you have a great number of women. So you, you must always ask why. The why question is very curious because for us to I amplify. I think we understand that Competence. it is Georgina Wood. They have a gender you know? strategy. And okay. they have a gender strategy. I was part of the team that helped them All right. in 2011. Okay. So I think, um, Angela, what we have to do is to highlight these success stories so the, the citizens will understand what benefits we stand to gain mm. when women are in these, you know, kinds of positions okay. and in spaces. So that is a very important um, right. provision to have. Also, mm. the requirement for Public Services Commission to equip women for promotion. I spoke about appointment promotions and elections. One of the ways to bridge the gap, if we allow organic growth, this is where we are. Mm. The uh, World Economic Forum says it will take us 135 years to bridge the gender pay gap, 135 years, you know, even with all these interventions, all these, um, you know, demands and laws and, you know, agreements we are ratifying. Ghana has ratified so many international mm -hmm. conventions around the issues of gender equality, but we are so consumed with, method, um, with, with names and framing that we even think that equality, there's a misconception about the meaning of equality that makes people in, uh, quite sensitive to the use of it, and we are pushing the, to call the law the gender equity bill. If we understood that equality at its base, at its foundation, is about opportunities, equality of opportunities and removing barriers to participation, mm. we wouldn't think that it is men coming, women coming to lord it over men or women taking over their positions. So the, the ways in which we can bridge the gap through affirmative action instrument is either by making appoint, appointments of women. And when you come to the politics, which is the weaker aspect of this law, we have an executive presidency. I have heard you talk about uh, reviewing the constitution to at least roll back some of the powers of the president. He has such wide-ranging appointive powers. So if you have wide-ranging appointive powers, it means you can appoint qualified women into positions, which is why some of us were quite disappointed when he went to Canada and said that Ghanaian women hadn't shown enough dynamism. Today I heard from Gloria that as a, 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 a remedial action, the manifesto committee of their party insisted chairs and co-chairs to be women, it's good. Because of the backlash that President Ekufado got by telling us that Ghanaian women hadn't shown enough dynamism, who is more dynamic in this space mm. than Ghanaian women? So I think he must situate the implementation mm. at the office of the presidency to give it back in and ensure that at least the structures that are needed, because there would be some um, expense to the public Pace. Okay. But this is good expense because mm. the bottom line right. would eventually. So this okay. is what I wanted to talk about if, if there is time to talk about it. But the first one, because I think we should just um, pictorially understand what uh, this entire inequality, equity thing I need you to about. run through it quickly. Yes, quickly. Mm. So um, I, then please use the first one, okay? Otherwise, just leave it. You see, this, the, the tree, the tree, you can come back to that other one because I won't have time to do the tree is the systems, okay. the systems, the structures, and those are the systemic barriers to participation. And here is the legal barriers, the institutional barriers, the cultural policy, even administrative barriers. So you would see that there's a system that is skewed to the advantage of some members of the society. Okay, even though the fruits are there, yes, mm. the, even though, and physiologically can also represent so many other things. Mm. Okay, just see it at that. So this portends an unequal situation where someone has access to our collective resources and opportunities and others are disadvantaged. If you come to the equality debate, after seeing these systemic imbalances in our society where women's participation, when people with um, disability participation, where even regional and other ethnic balance issues come at play, yeah. the conversations are around how do we make access to our collective opportunities more equal. Okay. So intervention comes, let's give everybody an equal playing field. Yeah. So our constitution says no discrimination. And yet, so even though we have non-discriminatory policies, what do we see? From the third equity level, we see that people are still unable to access because of their peculiar challenges. And so equity says that, no, there are real barriers to participation. How do we bridge the barriers? So what do they do? You recognize those that are in need of 
more support. So if there are few women representation, how do we increase the numbers? Okay. Through an affirmative action you know, instrument. So you would see in the third picture on equity that we are now trying to balance the equation based off on our individual peculiarities and challenges. But the real ideal situation is a recognition of the, oh, the problem, the, the root cause of the problem, which are the systemic challenges okay. that I spoke to you earlier. When we align the structure of our society, where truly every member of the society is able to access public goods equally, people with disability can have access to this story building because there's a disability access. These are real, germane, sensitive issues that create a freer and fair society. And at the ideal stage, when we have liberation, mm. there are no barriers. Thank we you. can all participate fully and effectively. And that is what Thank this you. affirmative action Thank you very much. would yes. achieve. Bobby. Okay. Yes. Um, first, I would want to congratulate Auntie Sheila. Mm. Uh, um, I don't know, you know that. She has been at this for years. And I had the opportunity to live with her and her husband. She's been Capremo for years, so I know how passionate she has been at this. So congratulations to her. Um, I, I, I had a cursory look at the law. There's one thing that I found rather curious, the power given to the minister to give exemption. I think that we'll be creating another problem with that, particularly when there's a, a committee, a structure that has been established to monitor and implement the provisions of the law. Why do you give one single person the opportunity to exempt. Mm. Okay. Oh, they have changed it. Okay. okay. Then, right. then I, I'm happy that. So, that, so that, once again, let's be minded mm -hmm. that we are waiting for the final deal, okay. yes. which will be assented to That's by the president. Right. Okay. I doubt there will be any reason for refusing assent. <laughs> Can you imagine any reason to refuse assent? Refuse assent. Yes. Um, it would be difficult, you know. But there was a, there was a provision in it which they also took out, which we thought, you know. There was something that we call um, bona fide occupational requirements. Mm -hmm. So for a particular thing, mm. you know, you know, there's a difference between mm. sex mm. issues. Mm. When it comes to sexual differences, mm. men are stronger, mm. they are whatever it mm. is. So provision was made for that small window where somebody, you, you can make a case that look for this particular job, maybe I need a man, mm. or whatever. So mm. that the committee would consider okay. and give yeah. access. But so I'm happy if it's with the committee. I, right. I, it's the, I mean, the, the, the population of Ghana is almost equally split. I mean, the women even are more, are more. than it's the men. Yeah. And so if the, it's, it becomes, and especially the area about the political party uh, role. Even on our, our electoral electra register, electra register, the women are, are more than yes. men. And yeah. so if you have the political parties yeah. being held accountable by the coalitions and the CSOs that we would want to see how Unfortunately, I'm not sure they can start working on it this election year, but at least from next election year, all your appointments, because most of the parliamentarians have already yes. been elected. Now, I was just uh, thinking, I mean, this is a very good thing, um, but could we also have an affirmative action, even something like that, for the youth? Perhaps. I was okay. just thinking along those lines that, uh, I mean... If, if we look at those things in that, uh, in that sorry. sector, but... <laughs> sorry, Bobby, sorry. <laughs> Which no, no, you no, will no, not no, qualify. It's, it's I mean, because because we, have, we have, across Africa now, from Kenya, Nigeria, started with the Arab Spring, the youth saying, and the youth, both men and women, that we have a political class that seem not to be interested in our development. And so this is perfect. It's taking more than 10 years. Okay. To bring it to this light, so Perhaps maybe you maybe we can youth, take youth budgeting. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, we, we, we have a whole ministry. <laughs> well, <for> I, <laughs> I was just going to reference policy, yes. the <laughs> point you made about the constitution, mm -hmm. particularly the directive principles of state policy. Mm -hmm. You know, even the, pronoun, the, the pronunciations that have been made by the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they say it's justiciable, and other times they say it is not. It's just a guide, but with the law. I think the difference is that you can go to court and enforce it. Yes. If, if it is deliberately not mm. being implemented. That's that's it. And that's the difference. And I totally agree with them. You see, what they are doing, the advocates, what they are doing, they are not representing the interests of women. No, that's not it. If you understand it better, they are representing the interests of society. Yep. That's it. That's the reflection that's the that I see. Yeah. Just advocating for a balance. They are not asking for more than they, they are supposed to be given and all that. There are some areas where naturally some of these things have been solved. 
<laughs> by interest shown and qualifications and competencies and etc. Like I reference, Actually, I reference the UG, yes. then I reference the judiciary, and suddenly I realize that they are actually following a policy yes. because mm. I didn't know. Yes. So yeah. maybe that's what a policy mm. or Absolutely. by way of law mm. will do. At the University of Ghana, the chancellor, the vice chancellor, the registrar, the director of finance, the director of internal audit, all of them. Yeah. And yeah. in certain departments, many. And Dr. Eric Odrua Sai says, we need the affirmative action law like yesterday. yesterday. The University of Ghana is a about clear to, example about to come to, that no, if we are intentional about gender mainstreaming, yes. an effective partnership yes. between men and women, we will promote uh, and see more development in this country than before. Excellent. Congratulations Thank to you. all those who have worked tirelessly to see the passing of the Affirmative Action Bill into law. Yes, please continue. Yeah, so I was just about to say also mm. that not only that institution, I, I mentioned also the Office of Attorney General as okay. stands yes. today. Mm -hmm. You know, if you get there at the top, yes. you know, the DPP, the SG, the Director Drafting, you know, Copyright, then one of the deputies. All of them are female. And state attorneys. State attorneys, they are the majority. Mm -hmm. The females are forming an overwhelming majority mm -hmm. of those who are uh, offering their services to the country as, uh, as attorneys. Also because that. research found that, that females are largely less corrupt. It's, it's a science. It's a science. Forget the exceptions. It's a science. Well, well I will refuse to be drawn yes. to that point yes. for now. The, the, by the directive principles of state policy but, we just referred to. Yes. If you, why, why is it that we know the problems with women as far as polit uh, the political field is concerned, mm. yeah. the problems they face with finance and all. If she's successful, then she must be sleeping somewhere. Mm -hmm. That kind of crap we have heard over and again. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now, now, those who contest, there is opportunity for appointments onto the place. Mm. Why don't we use the appointments to at least try to equal yeah. the numbers? Yeah, that's also another way. That's, that's another that's way of doing special it. Measures. You know, so it has to be deliberate. You know, but if, if you look at, if you go back to the independent constitution and then those other things, there were deliberate policies that mm. were churned out and all that. But I'm saying, I just wanted to say that this law is long overdue. Right. Long, long, long overdue. Okay. We are crafting it at the time, we should have had it 30 years back. <laughs> you know, because of course today, as we are speaking, we have examples, clear examples of without even the affirmative mm. action uh, law coming into fruition. We have, I mean, deliberate public policy in some institutions that have been able to mm. breach this. And, and it has become history. Mm. So I will only say that uh, all of us who put our soldiers to feel and assist in the implementation process because we've had all the beautiful laws in this country, right. but our problem has always been the implementation. Yeah. Mm. We should not celebrate and go to sleep. Right. We should ensure that mm. we actually practicalize and operationalize it. And that is why I will urge that people should participate in the, in the, in the enactment of the legislative instrument that will operationalize the, mm -hmm. the act that's itself. That's very important. Yeah. Okay. But if you don't have that uh, to operationalize it, then right. the, uh, the purpose will be defeated. Right. Thank you. I, I wanted mm. to quickly just add that mm. we, we need leadership and commitment to ensure that this works. And some of the low-hanging fruits are elections. At least for the next um, four months, towards the December you know, 7th elections, the women who are on the ballot must be giving some consideration. Mm. A lot of them lost their primaries. Okay. We have 40 women. It's most likely if we don't, if we are not lucky, we will not even get the same numbers in Parliament. Mm. And the inter Interparliamentary mm. Union has given notice to countries who would fail to meet the minimum 30% by 2030 that they will be reduced from um, member status to observer status. Yeah. I would also like to suggest, yes, it will have cost like the Council of State elections, let's mm. see how we can do women elections regionally and ensure that at least we can have 16 women representatives okay. from 16 regions Thank of you. Ghana. Thank you very much. And then vote. Vote. I mean, we are going yeah. to most likely have a first female vice president, ah, Anna Jane. I knew you so would. So please ensure that, that, in. Thank that you we break that glass ceiling. And, uh, and, and, and if that says that the gender, <laughs> the want? gender ministry is also looking at sensitization, particularly concerning <laughs> public services, you once this bill me. is ascended to, and that is refreshing. Thank you very much. Uh, Edward Addo says, the issue of ladies who pass all aspects of entry qualifications into security agencies, but later disqualified on grounds of pregnancy, etc., is very bad. This law addresses that disastrous gaffe that we have suffered as a country. Um, well, 
join Nathaniel Atto on Joy Sports Link as he brings you revealing conversations on with goalkeeper and coach Fatal Dauda. Uh, which lady are you bringing on the show? Please uh, bring Veronica Komide, who famously celebrated after saving, saving a shot from Cristiano Ronaldo at the FIFA World Cup. He delves into his journey, which has now landed him the Black Stars goalkeeper's trainer role. The Joy Sports link with Nathaniel Atto will be live after the midday news. And my outfit, as always on this show, is paid for and made by Konati Clothing. You can find them at Adenta Shopping Center, Adenta Down. Call them 244 0244-676732. Join me on my favorite show tomorrow at 2 p.m. That is the law. And we're going to be continuing our discussion on justice for all and the miracles it is doing for the disadvantaged in our prisons. And then talk again about the alternative sentencing policies that a nation must have to have a sane community. There was a woman for lack of uh, the funds to pay for one city, got into jail. One city, one city, yes. Justice for all, save there, yes. <laughs> all right, so uh, thank you also very much, Sheila, um, Shamima, uh, Pemka, and Bobby Banson. I'm Samson Ladia Yanini. This show, as always, is paid for by Bank of Africa, MTN, Ashasi University, Robert and Sons Optical Services, My Way, Syntax Tanks, and Flamingo Paints. Have a good afternoon. <laughs>